morning and welcome to the ninth uh, meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee for 2018. Uh, we'd remind everyone in the public gallery to turn off any electrical devices that can interfere with the sound system. We have apologies from committee member Jackie Bailey. And uh, the first item on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items three and four in private. Are we agreed on that? Yes. Thank you. Uh, we now turn to our inquiry into Scotland's economic performance, and uh, we have three witnesses this morning, uh, one of whom is delayed slightly in traffic, but I uh, understand he'll be with us shortly. So at this point, we have Sir Harry Burns and Professor Sarah Carter. So welcome to both of you, and as I say, we'll be joined shortly by Professor Sir Anton Muscatelli. Now, I will start with a question just to perhaps uh, ask about an update on the Council for of Economic Advisors' recent activity, and um, I think uh, perhaps one of you would like to make a short statement on that. Um, Professor Carter. Thank you. Um, the Council of Economic Advisors has met regularly um, since 2016 in its present incarnation. And the focus has been very much on the Scotland's economic strategy. In particular, uh, we focused on inclusive growth and most recently on the establishment of the National Investment Bank. We have, of course, also focused on the Scotland's economic performance since the financial crisis in 2008-09 and the policy responses that were appropriate and, and, uh, and could be considered following uh, the crisis. We've also focused on future risks for the economy, in particular the risks over the next 10 years. Um, and of course, uh, we have focused specifically on Brexit and the impacts of Brexit. Um, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned, I think, the... Um just, just looking at the investment bank, I think it was first proposed in 2009 in a particular format. Um, that was slightly altered and then I think, um, I'm not sure if abandoned is the correct word, in about 2016. And we now have a, a new Scottish National Investment Bank proposed in 2017. Um, can you give any comment on what confidence we can have in the new proposal and that it will be uh, progressed? Well, the Council for Economic Advisers specifically discussed the idea of a national investment bank. Uh, of course, one of our colleagues, Mariana Matsukato, is very uh, strong, uh, a very strong proponent of this. But in actual fact, that her views are, I believe, shared by all members of the Council of Economic Advisers. We focused on this specifically in our response to the uh, Green Paper on industrial, UK Industrial Strategy, where we focused specifically on the benefits and the, to Scotland of setting up a national investment bank. And I think that that process of making that response to, to the UK Green Paper really helped corral and shape uh, a shared vision of what the national investment bank would be across the, across the, the council. I, I think there are three issues about the kind of the current proposal that give me particular comfort and the first is um, the focus that, that the National Investment Bank has to be strategic in its investments, it has to be mission oriented in its investments and it also has to provide patient, patient capital and I think it's these three dynamics of the National Investment Bank which make it uh, a, a very uh, welcome new addition to Scotland's economic agencies and economic levers. Thank you. Um, Sir Harry Burns, do you want to add anything to that at this stage? N no, not uh, particularly. Um, my, my interest, I mean, I have to bow to the expertise of the economists on the Council of Economic Advisors as a humble medic, um, but my interest has been in pretty much in the inclusive growth agenda, the whole impact of inequalities on 
potential for economic growth and the impact of the economy on inequalities, the sort of circular argument there. So I'll bow to Sarah's expertise in this area. Fair enough. Uh, we'll come now to a question from Gordon MacDonald. Much convener. Um, general question to start, how do you see the Scottish economy has performed over the last 10 years? can give my reflections on that. I mean, I think if you're thinking about the last 10 years, then everything that we see has been shaped by the financial crisis of 2008-9. I think, you know, if you look at the 10 years prior to 2008, you'll see actually pretty strong growth. But everything over the last 10 years has been shaped by the impact of the financial crisis and the policy responses that, that we were able to... That, we, as a, as, a, as a nation, were able to, to focus on. I think some of the policy responses to that, which, which have been welcomed, uh, for example, infrastructure investment. I think, um, I think the, 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 in terms of the labour market, I think the apprenticeships growth has been really welcomed. Uh, and in terms of, of family policy, I think, you know, even childcare policy. So, so I think when we're thinking about the last 10 years, what we're seeing is we're seeing an economy where the labour market has been resilient in terms of employment, high levels of employment, low levels of unemployment, but we're still suffering from uh, perhaps a lack of productivity and we need to focus more on exports. And I think also, as part of that, we, we over-rely on a small number of firms for our productivity and export performance. And so from my perspective as, as an entrepreneurship um, kind of uh, professor, that's, that's my subject, um, what I would like to see is a much broader growth of small firms to kind of move not the frontier firms, but the firms perhaps in kind of quadrant twos and threes get these current small firms up to a state where they can contribute more to the overall economy in terms of productivity and exporting. So for me, I think, I think um, we're seeing strengths, but everything that's happened over the past 10 years has been shaped by the financial crisis. And of course, we now have Brexit. In, in, in terms of the, um, you, you said there was an over-reliance on a small number of companies. Uh, I think the, the numbers I saw was about around about half a percent are companies that have more than 250 employees. With you know looking at the, the business base in Scotland, um, as part of the problem we've got is there's a lack of um, Scottish-based headquarters, uh, and you know most companies in Scotland have very few employees. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So is is that the difficulty that we saw wholesale? Um, takeovers in the 70s and 80s and we don't have that mm. business base that we mm. once had. Mm. I, yeah, I think, I think that's it, there's sort of two different responses I would give to that. I mean, first of all, I would say, yes, absolutely, the vast majority of Scotland's enterprises are small. 70% um, are self-employed, another 28% are in the small category, so that's 1 to 49 employees, and of those, most of them are kind of under 5 employees. But in that respect, Scotland is no different from almost any other developed economy around the world where there is a, a huge reliance and a, and a, and a huge participation of, 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 of SMEs. And I think how we address those SMEs and how we encourage them and support them is, is an issue to, to discuss. I think in, in regard to Scottish headquarters, I think, I think there is an issue there about we have a, a, perhaps a, a very small number of large companies I think perhaps more of more concern, there's a very small number of medium-sized companies, and it's that missing middle that perhaps is more uh, of, of more concern, or should be of more concern. Um, of course, the, the inclusive growth agenda is very much about a bottom-up approach. And so what I would argue is that actually um, we can perhaps mourn and lament the, the sort of uh, the lack of large companies but it's also incumbent on us to actually really start addressing how we grow and support our, our, our large number of small companies and how we support, perhaps in, encourage them to be more ambitious and support their ambitions. It's a, it's a tougher thing to do, but it might, I think the prize might be bigger. And, you know, and you, you've said everything's got to be viewed through the 2008 financial crisis. But have we seen any improvement uh, 
say GDP growth or productivity or exports? I mean, has there has there been improvement during this very difficult period? Yes, I think <laughs> Sorry, I th I, yes, I think the data shows sort of modest improvements, and I, certainly we've we've seen a, a, a very resilient labour market. Um, so we have, as, as I've already said, you know, we have sort of almost near record levels of employment and very low levels of unemployment. But within the labour market, for example, I think we have to start thinking about underemployment. Um, for women, I think a large number of women are still employed on part time contracts. So I, th I think that there are there are definitely there's definitely signs of progress. Um, we we do see you know companies export. We we do see kind of you know sort of tentative kind of increases in productivity. So there are there are signs of recovery um, for sure. But I think this still has to be nurtured. Yeah. And my last question, in terms of inclusive growth um, and measuring uh, the performance of the economy, are we measuring the right things? Oh, well, <laughs> perhaps I can pass it over to my colleague. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, you know, GDP is the only game in town in terms of measuring the growth of the economy, and GDP only measures what we produce and what we consume. We have huge inequalities in... Um, health and well-being, in terms of educational attainment and so on. And GDP doesn't take that into account. It doesn't take into account the impact of um, production on the, on the environment or anything like that. And there are a number of alternatives to GDP out there that do take these into account. And my feeling is that it's only when we begin to look at, uh, take into account educational failure, um, health failure and so on, that we will get a, f a, a real understanding of opportunities to improve productivity. Um, and it, but of course, in the meantime, as I say, since what Bretton Woods in the 1940s, GDP has been the holy grail. And it's increasingly, it's just not doing it. The really interesting um, Data emerging from the United States, everyone here will have heard of the Glasgow effect, I suppose, which is the increase in mortality for, due to drugs, alcohol, suicide and violence in younger working age men in Glasgow since the 70s. Angus Deaton, the uh, Nobel Prize winning economist in the States, has recently published a similar analysis which shows that m white men in their 50s in the United States since 2000 have had a 250% increase in death rate from drugs, alcohol and suicide. And he's sh produced some very elegant um, maps which show that the counties which were highest in the support for President Trump in the election were the counties that have these high mortalities. And he's describing this as deaths of despair. You know, when people don't feel secure in terms of their income, other, so on. That's what happens, and that's what's happened in the West, West Central Scotland, and to a certain extent, Dundee as well, since the 50s, 60s. So we need to begin to start look, producing incentives in the economy to tackle this inequality. So inclusive growth, I think, is a long way off the pace at the moment, using conventional metrics. Thanks very much. Quick follow-up from Gillian Martin and then to Tom Arthur. I'm really interested to hear what you're talking about around about inclusive growth and particularly your example there you gave around men's men's health. So the, recently, of course, we had the minimum, minimal alcohol pricing. Um, do you see even things like that that might not look like an economic uh, policy having an impact on, on, on that? Yes, I mean, the evidence is that minimum pricing will help, but it's a... It's a tiny part of this. It's a very complex system with associations all over the place that you're not sure are they causally associated or what. And the answer in moving a complex system forward is to do lots of things and see what works and scale them up. And the whole system begins to move. And you might never attribute benefit to one particular action you've taken. But if we're not measuring the right things to begin with, we'll never know if we're moving in the right direction. And being able to, being able to measure 
um, educational failure, um, crime, offending behaviour and so on, that will tell us if our society is becoming more cohesive. You know, social cohesion seems to be at the heart of a lot of these deaths of despair and the breakdown of social cohesion. And um, things that we might do that would support people who currently feel despairing at the, the, um, their insecurity and the, the threat that they might feel, the homelessness and so on that's out there, that will have an impact on our productivity. I'm absolutely sure of that. Professor Muscatelli, who's just joined us, and come to Tom Arthur. A follow-up. Um, so how do you spoke in reference to men in their 50s and 60s. I wonder what your views are on the impact of insecure and precarious work on those in their 20s and 30s. Um, how that correlates to health inequalities, educational inequalities, for example, a child being raised in a home where both parents or one parent is in insecure work how that impacts. Um, how do you think we go and shift to a more holistic look and understanding? Um, and beyond that, what do you, how, how, how should politicians discuss and how can we, um, the, the, the broader, um, these broader aspects that impinge upon things such as growth, should we be thinking about growth should, um, itself? Is that a, a, a measurement that is perhaps redundant? It, it, no, I don't think growth is redundant as long as it's the right type of growth. Um, in terms of their 20s, I mean, we're currently looking at a wide inequality across Scottish society in mortality in the 40s and 50s. Um, 20 years ago, that was manifest in the 20s and 30s. We've seen this cohort of young people born in the 60s and so on moving through the population with this wide inequality. So, yes, it has an impact. There's huge interest now in adverse childhood experiences. So families where there is poverty, where there is insecurity, you get high levels of domestic violence, and there's a big, big, long-term, long-running study in the United States that shows that the single biggest determinant of educational failure is witnessing domestic violence in the home. So that kind of chaos that occurs as a result of poverty and insecurity is running its way through the whole of society. And what, what I believe we're seeing is a sort of intergenerational cycle. You know, the, the young people who grew up are now having children. These children are being born into f homes where parents don't know how to be parents. And they, in turn, will produce the next generation of wide inequality. In terms of growth, the problem with GDP is it's measuring consumption and it's measuring production production essentially of money. Um, it doesn't measure impact of production on air quality, on a whole range of environmental things, our use of natural resources, but it doesn't take into account inequality. And there are alternatives, well, you know, that have been developed um, sustain based on um, sustainable uh, uh, goals as enunciated by uh, the World Health Organization and so on, sustainable development goals, where we could monitor how we were doing. And at the moment, there's a belief amongst many economists that um, are talking about this, that actually it's in the interests of big business to continue to just, you know, they can predict what's going to happen to the stock market on the basis of GDP figures. So, that's, so they're very comfortable with that. So there is a, a vested interest in keeping with GDP. But I think if we are genuinely going to go for a safer society in which everyone has an equal opportunity to attain their, their full potential in life, then we have to develop, we have to grasp some of these other measures. Specific danger regarding people in their twenties and thirties with the decrease in social mobility. If I think about my parents' generation, my father was born on a single end and my mother born in a prefab in Barhead in the early fifties. They were able to go on and have successful careers in the NHS and give my my, my siblings and I a kind of level of quality of life far better to what they ever had. However, people of my generation are now facing that, that, that's a prospect they can't look forward to. In fact, he's facing staying a real time reduction in their kind of spending power and quality. 
of life. What impact do you think that has upon the psychological and mental well-being of people in their 20s and 30s? The prefab swear in my head, actually. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I was brought up quite close to them. Um, so, I th I'm not sure that social mobility is, per is as, constri as constrained. I've got no... Figures, I haven't seen figures that show that it need be. I mean, I think that if young people are nurtured appropriately, if they're given support, and we're seeing mentoring programmes, MCR Pathways for One, which is um, very active in a number of schools across Scotland, where, I mean, a former medical colleague of mine who's acting as a mentor there, I bumped into him recently and he was cock -a hoop because a young boy had been mentoring from Possel Park who was so, family were so poor that he was walking 45 minutes to school and back each day. He's just got into medical school. Um, now, you know, folk in Bears Den and Lindsay and so on struggle to get into medical school. So it's possible to support young people to be socially mobile and we should build on these kind of capacities. But there is no doubt that the more we support families in poverty, who feel insecure in their housing, who feel insecure in their futures, the more we're going to get positive outcomes from their children and from themselves. The less domestic violence you have, the more likely you are to have um, uh, positive outcomes. So I think if we set ourselves a set of measures of economic progress that included measures of inclusiveness and held ourselves to account on those, that would produce a step change in outcome in terms of the economy. I really believe that. Thank you. Right, we'll move to questions from John Mason. Hey, thanks so much, uh, <coughs> Um I mean, I'm interested in the kind of general area of how the council relates to the government and, um, you know, perhaps we could look at some examples of, of, of how there's been interaction. So, I mean, in the first place, can you explain to me, do, do you come up with new ideas and bounce them off the government? Or does the government come up with new ideas and bounce them off you? Or is that not really quite how it works? <laughs> yes, it's, 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 I, I think we could all That's answer right. that question, but I, I think we'd probably all say the same thing. It's a little bit of both. I mean, we, we have very open discussions, but maybe Anton would like to participate. Yes, I mean, I think it's a bit of both. Uh, I, I, let me give you a couple of examples. I think that's easier to illustrate it with a... Uh, I mean, something which certainly the government consulted us on, as you know, is around the issue of raising tax bans and tax rates at the higher end. And so a lot of the work was done within the office of the uh, of the uh, chief economist. But we, as a uh, as is minuted indeed, I think in our, in, our, in our deliberations, we were you know we we provided advice on how to look at that. In areas like inclusive growth, or indeed uh, uh, areas to other areas to do with uh, innovation and the and uh, and how to encourage innovation or entrepreneurship, which is sort of Sarah has led with, there's been work streams within the council in a very informal way discussing these issues, putting some input into uh, the office of uh, the chief economic advisor, which then uh, have come to the fore through papers uh, at the meeting of the council itself. So so that, that gives you two examples of one that is more sort of led by us with work streams and others which have been, you know, here's an issue, um, what do you think about it in the, in the case of tax bans? That's very helpful. So if we take innovation then, do you feel that the comments or recommendations or the work that the council has done has impacted on government policy and thinking? Yeah, well, if you, yes, I, I, I think so. I mean, I think one of the issues that we're that I'm particularly concerned about, and you know, this is something that has been discussed within the Council of Economic Advisers, is the relatively low levels of business investment, and particularly business investment in R and D. And I think that that's a, 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 an issue that the, that the economy uh, that impacts on the, on the economy negatively. Now, where I think I think there are very important strengths in the Scottish economy within innovation, and particularly if you look at our research-intensive universities, I think there's uh, you know, great strengths in terms of higher education innovation 
and a relationship between government and universities through, for example, the innovation centres, through the catapults, um, through, in my own university very recently, the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland has been set up, which, and I think that gives us great, a great basis for uh, discussing innovation and developments in, 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 in innovation. But from my own particular perspective, I'm very concerned about the lack of business R&D and business innovation. And so the discussions within the council have been around how do we increase this? How do we get more businesses to invest in uh, R&D and innovation? Have you then made specific recommendations to the government on that point? Or are you not quite there yet or what? I, I think that this is a the, the discussions that we hold in the Council for Economic Advisers um, are generally within the presence of government ministers and therefore it's more collaborative than rather than us having a discussion and telling government it is a collaboration because the discussions take place within in the presence of, of government ministers and of course our minutes are, are, are uh, you know uh, put in within the, the public domain very quickly if I could come in on that yes I mean we what we uh, and, and particularly in the area of the uh, industrial strategy and innovation. When the UK government published its green paper, uh, we discussed it in the relevance of Scotland. And actually, out of that came a submission to that particular green paper consultation, which, if you see, trails effectively the creation of the Scottish National Investment Bank, So, which is exactly the sort of issues that Sarah was talking about, essentially trying to deal with issues of market failure uh, in terms of... Uh, patient capital in terms of mission-oriented investment. So uh, many of the themes that you see there, you will find echoed in the presentation that came out, uh, I think, a week ago or so on the SNIB and the potential to develop the SNIB as, as, as an investment bank. But you know, you, uh, you, you'll see our submission to the UK government green paper as being essentially trailing some of that. OK, I mean, I think one of my colleagues will ask more about the bank uh, in due course. I mean, just to take the other example you gave then was a uh, tax bans and rates. You said that the government had well, asked you for comment on that. I mean, I mean, again, did you have much comment to make and, and do you think the government took that on board? I think we did. Uh, I think we discussed quite a bit the issues around uh, some of the elasticities, the, the tax elasticities. Um, of course, a lot of the technical work was done from within government, uh, but of of course, the, the council includes a, a number of experts uh, around the whole area of economics. We looked at the extent to which some of these elasticities would be relevant in Scotland. Of course, none of us know exactly until you try because you know, we haven't had any experience in this field. But that's that's the, the that's a general discussion. That it was led by an initial paper which came from uh, government from officials, and then we made our own contribution. I think it was listened to uh, because I think certainly voices around the table were saying, well, if you make a large increase, you're likely to see these behavioral changes. These are the sorts of elasticities we've seen at UK level and other countries. If you go for more moderate increases, then you're less likely to see behavioral shifts. And, and maybe just one final question. Uh, if I mean, I don't know how, uh, Harry Burns, you, uh, come in on all this because is there ever a tension that you know one side's looking for economic growth and the other side's looking for a bit more sharing it out I, i'm not conscious of any tension at all i mean i think um we are all we're all in this together we're all seeing a f flourishing future scotland and you know we have discussions about what flourishing means and Basically, as far as I'm concerned, it means that everyone has an equal chance in life of attaining their full potential. And I think that's, that's agreed. There's certainly no, uh, no tensions at all between uh, different interest groups in the Council. If I can add to that as well, actually, I think it's, it's uh, really important that uh, the Council for Economic Advisers doesn't view inclusive growth as some kind of trade-off with economic prosperity. I believe that there is consensus across the council members that inclusive growth is very much part and parcel of economic prosperity. And the way we look at inclusive, uh, inclusive growth is that it's has to, economic growth has to include the broadest range, the widest range of people and places. It's about economic success, but also about equality of outcome and equality of opportunity. So it's about increasing the number of people who both contribute towards and benefit from economic prosperity. I, I think that that's a, a shared view of the council members. 
Thanks so much. Um, I think Gordon MacDonald wanted to come in on one of those points. Just a very quick question, and it was a point that uh, Professor Carter raised in relation to uh, business R&D spend, and, and it's lower than the rest of the UK. Is there any one thing that the Scottish Government isn't currently doing that it could do to change it? And also, bearing in mind that the Scottish economy isn't exactly a, a mirror of the UK economy, um, is there anything that the UK government could do in terms of R&D tax credits or corporation tax system that would improve that situation? I, I mean, I think there's a range of, of issues that, that, uh, could include, that could improve the situation, and certainly R&D tax credits have, you know, have been demonstrably helpful within you know, both, both the United States uh, and also within the UK. Actually, I think when it comes to small firms, I think the problem actually requires a more hands-on approach. And I don't think this is... A, I, I don't think small firms respond terribly directly to issues such as, for example, tax advantages. I think what, what we need to do with our small firms is actually to work with them more closely, to actually kind of almost get under the skin of the business to help them realise people, to get people to realise what their growth ambitions could be and what they could achieve. And I think this has been brought home to me over the last few years. Um, in, within my, Again, if you don't mind me talking about my own academic department, the Hunter Centre, a few years ago we saw that there was a gap in the support landscape for SMEs, and it was about trying to get businesses to grow. We've got a proliferation of small firms, but we need scaled up enterprises. A few years ago, we introduced a growth advantage program, which is we, we interview 20 companies, they're local companies in Glasgow, and over a period of six months, they meet once at one, one weekend a month. And it's very much peer learning and peer support, but it's facilitated by the university. We bring in experts, and it's also all about raising not just their ambition, but also their sense of efficacy that they can achieve an ambition. And at the end of six months, what we've seen is kind of both a 10% growth in, in, in sales, uh, sorry, 10% growth in employment and a 13% growth in sales. Now, that's just over six months. And then, of course, annualized growth over a three-year period is much greater than that. Now... Those kinds of initiatives where you're actually working with small firms are really important in terms of changing uh, them, changing them, and also adding dynamism to the economy. But of course, that takes hands-on work. So, you know, I think that it's, it's a harder ask, but I think that the effects are more profound and the prize is greater if we can do that, if we can work directly with small firms to a, a, allow them to scale up. Scottish enterprise do through their account managed companies? Um, yes, well, out of th I think 360,000 enterprises we have in Scotland, there are only 2,000 of those that are account managed by Scottish enterprise. We can't possibly rely on Scottish enterprise to do it all. I think traditionally there's been, a, there's been a, 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 an issue with Scottish enterprise in terms of the thresholds that companies have to achieve in order to get onto the account managed programme in the first place. And I think what we're trying to do is plug that gap between ordinary small firms and those firms that have reached those thresholds to get onto Scottish Enterprise Account Management. And that's where the, the gap is in terms of support. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, convener, I just want to ask a question about the Council. Um, but before I do, I just want to pick up a couple of points made by the uh, panel. Um, the, the Finance Committee, when it was doing work on preventative spend in 2010, uh, cited evidence that 40 to 45 percent of public spending was focused on on failure demand. Um, we've got a situation where among 16 and 34 year olds, 13 percent of them were living in private rented accommodation in 1999. Now it's 41 percent. Um, folk living in private rented housing, living in poverty, has doubled since 2000, but in social housing, it's halved. To what extent is the is the council across the fact that? unless people have decent housing um, and have um, can afford to live at the very basic level, then all this talk about economic performance and growth and stuff is really a bit of a distraction. The issue of failure demand is something that I've been particularly concerned about, particularly within healthcare, um, where people chase targets and so on, that, and maybe, you know, 
the issue of four-hour waits in A&E is one thing, but why are so many people coming into A&E in the first place? Uh, these sort of questions, and that, that to tackle that requires us to stand back and look at the whole system, the system that leads to people to fail, to be living in inadequate housing and so on, and that's really difficult. You know, people struggle to get their heads round that and we tend to oversimplify it and, you know, here is a solution to that problem and we try it and it doesn't work and it doesn't work because you need to try 10 or 15 different things and do them all consistently. So I have been certainly arguing, not just within the council, but with other uh, colleagues within the Scottish Government that we need a whole systems approach to this kind of issue. And that means being courageous in terms of what we try, sticking our necks out and getting the public sector to work differently. If you remember the Christie Commission talked very much about prevention, but Christie Commission um, uh, recommendations have never really been put into effect because the method for delivering those recommendations is just so difficult. So we've been talking about how we start doing that, how we start identification of people living in chaotic circumstances, and we start looking very closely at how they might be helped to begin to take control of their lives. I've been gathering evidence from a range of projects um, that have been carried out in other places. And I'll just give you one example, if I may. Um, I was giving a talk in the United States recently, and one of these interventions was being trialled. Um, this uh, American had picked the sort of intervention that I think would be quite important. He was doing a randomised controlled trial of this intervention. And what he was doing, he was using a concept from medical trials called number needed to treat. So if you want to prevent a heart attack or stroke by giving someone low-dose aspirin, the number you need to treat to prevent one adverse outcome, like a heart attack or stroke, is 1,600 people. He said, so far, in the course of this study, the number of people living in difficulty that you needed to treat with this intervention to prevent a suicide attempt or an arrest was 10. And you begin to think, it's a bit of a no-brainer here. You know, we really need to try this kind of approach. So there are approaches, certainly we're in discussion with Scottish Government colleagues about these approaches, and it's about giving people a decent, secure life that gives them a sense of purpose and meaning that allows them to feel in control of their lives and that helps them move on. So, yeah, I'm right up for that. Discussions include the thorny question you've just put your finger on about how to, um, if I could say, account for this, because we have plenty of debates in this place about <laughs> please don't cut the spending of £100,000 on a yellow bus at the top of Leith Walk that's out there on a Friday and Saturday night because it's helping folk get home who are otherwise end up in A&E or prisons and stuff. But it seems that it's very difficult to have a, a, an accounting system that allows the benefits, the alleged benefits of uh, interventions like that to be paid for out of savings in other places. And uh, I mean, the current government's got an ambition to spend £500 million over the life of this parliament over the rate of inflation on the health service. Um, uh, Actually, we should be aiming, I think, to reduce the spending on the health service. Um, and we do that by making sure that people don't need to end up in the health service. You can never abolish it, of course. People will always, always get sick and stuff. So, I mean, is, is there any work being done in the council on how you do that accounting? Because that seems fundamental to us in all subject committees in this parliament. One example, one, one discussion that we had was around uh, the interconnectedness of, of different types of spending interventions around the diagnostic, the North Ayrshire diagnostic. And this is an attempt to try and see, well, you know, if, you've, if you want to understand how inclusive growth can actually be put in practice, given the fact that different economic interventions impact in different ways, you need to understand all the connections. Um, I mean, it is difficult, as Harry was saying, you know, it's because partly because a lot of, as you, as you pointed out in, in the example you gave, a lot of the, 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 the spending competence is cut across different local authorities and therefore it isn't a single, you know, there isn't a single level of control. I think, I think the work we've, 
which was done, of course, internally in government, but we were exposed to that and we contributed to that discussion. It was very, a very good discussion because I think it begins to scope out where you might have to say uh, to different local authorities, you need to work together. Here are two or three areas where one is having an impact. One, one element is of, of spend in one area is having an impact on another. And you know, there's non-overlapping competencies. Now, I mean, that's just one example, I think, of, of, of studies that can help. Wearing a different hat, uh, I chair the Commission on, uh, on Economic Growth, which evaluates the Glasgow City deal. And we're beginning to uh, try to do an evaluation of one of the first projects around Site Hill, uh, which you know is is an infrastructure project, but has potential multiple impacts and on 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 a really deprived area of, of Glasgow, and so we're beginning to look scope out there, saying, well, let's do a pilot here. Let's see how it's impacting on different elements, not just on the infrastructure itself and the evaluation of the GVA from that, but the impact on on what's happening to people's lives, to to their work patterns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Thank. You. Just come back and give you a statistic that I think might um, cause some eyebrows to raise. This American study of adverse childhood experiences, which has been running for a long time, has very robust data. They've calculated that one year's worth of child neglect, that cohort of children in that year who have been neglected, they will cost throughout their lifetime, the American economy, $124 billion in terms of costs of care, costs of health care, costs of imprisonment, because a large proportion of them will go to jail, failure to pay taxes because they'll never work. Now, pro rata, that one year's worth of children in Scotland should cost about £1.8 billion. Pounds. So the kids born in 1960s into chaotic homes, they'll be costing in excess of a billion pounds over their lifetime and so on. So we're ratcheting up significant costs and, you know, a failure demand I was discussing recently was the costs of taking children into care. Some children with difficult behaviour problems, it can cost a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year to look after them. How much better would it be to give the parents maybe fifty thousand pounds as a salary to look after them and help them and a mentor them and so on so that the child is brought up in a home that can support them. It would save money and you get a better outcome at the end of the day. So there's a number of things that we really need to get quite courageous about in order to make a change. Okay, thank you very much. I've got a brief follow-up to a point that Professor Carter made. You said that small firms don't respond to tax advantages. Um, has the council looked at the small business bonus scheme, which is costing £250 million a year? Thank you. It wasn't that small firms don't respond to tax advantages. It was, I, I, I believe, what I, what I meant to say was that the, the tax advantages are perhaps less important than direct intervention through, for example, training programmes. So, uh, yes, of course, small firms. So, um, just a sort of technical question. You, you formally met once in 2017 and had four conference calls. You last met in January this year. I think your last report was 2016. Do you have a a report scheduled for 2017-18, and, and does your um, program of meetings, is that kind of ad hoc, or do you try and schedule them? Who's in charge of the agenda? Well, first of all, we, we haven't brought out a, a, a report, but that's because our minutes are now put online very quickly, and so they're in the public domain very quickly, and I think that that probably removes the need for a kind of a, a big fancy report at the end of the year. Um, in terms of meetings, we uh, we try to schedule two meetings a year. Uh, we know the months. Uh, they're scheduled whenever we can. In, a, in addition to the meetings that we had last year, the, the 2017, in 2017, we had one meeting, I think you said, I, and uh, a number of conference calls. We also um, were very strongly, most of the members of the council were very strongly involved in the Inclusive Growth Conference that took place in Glasgow in, in the autumn. And that was another opportunity for us to, to meet, or many of us to meet and discuss and present our work and to listen to other countries' works in the area of, of inclusive growth. So, so there are formal meetings that are scheduled and minuted of course, but uh, also last year, the second meeting was almost replaced by the Inclusive Growth Conference that took place. 
And, and just finally, I mean, all, all the members of the Council are very prominent in their own fields and have lots of useful, interesting things to say and regularly do say interesting things um, on their own account. I'm just wondering if the Council ever feels that it's obviously its job is to advise ministers, but um, do members ever, ever feel that the need to perhaps um, come together and put something into the public domain that's uh, help inform the public and perhaps provoke debate around a topic that it feels isn't getting enough attention? Or would that be going beyond your... Your, uh, your competent, your, your uh, responsibilities and role. We are, it's the Council of Economic Advisers to the First Minister, uh, so that is our role. Um, I think it's an interesting one that you've talked about in terms of uh, putting our work, uh, our work and thoughts into the public domain. Of course, we all do that individually, but collectively, I think that the council meetings, um, Anton and I both referred to earlier to, to the council's um, submission to the Green Paper, the UK Green Paper on Industrial Strategy, um, the conference on inclusive growth that many of us participated in. I do believe that almost as a council, we do interact together quite, quite a bit. But my colleagues will also want to say something, I'm sure. No, I think that's exactly right. I think, you know, we didn't feel that it would be particularly useful for us to prepare reports that were just sitting there as discussion papers. Apart from anything else, it would actually soak up a huge amount of resource from, um, from officials who actually would be better placed actually trying to implement some of the advice that we, we're giving in terms of policy as opposed to simply, you know, give, giving, giving space to just write up what what our, our musings, if you like. But I, I do think, you know, if you give back to the example in the Green Paper, we didn't go into that session saying we shall submit something independently as a group of Council of Economic Advisors to the Green Paper. It came out as part of our discussion to say, look, we think we should be submitting something to, 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 to the uh, consultation, and we did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was a departure in a sense, actually, because we ended up um, putting in a submission which was independent of that of government. Thank you. Dean Locker. Um, <coughs> thank you very much. Um, I would like to get the panel's views on the Scottish Government's economic policy, the 4i policy. Uh, we've touched on inclusive growth, but the other elements are investment, increasing investment, uh, internationalisation and innovation. These are obviously important outcomes, and I think everyone agrees with those outcomes. But if you compare it with, for example, the UK industrial strategy or the economic strategy in other countries like Germany or Singapore, it's quite light on detail. Um, do you think we could get more guidance or the economic strategy would benefit from having more detail and more definitions and more guidance as to how to achieve those four I out outcomes? I think that's, an interesting, that's a really interesting question. I, I think uh, to some extent there's no doubt that um, you know, what's been happening in the last couple of years, particularly post post uh, the Brexit referendum, is that a, a lot of bandwidth is being taken up to try and understand exactly where we're going to be and therefore what sort of interventions would you, would you want. I mean, I mean, I'll refer back to something that Sarah said earlier because I think it's, it's really important. I mean, a question was asked as to is there a single intervention that's going to generate innovation investment and the answer is I'm afraid there isn't because if, if there was we would have we would have discovered it many years ago but the sort of range of interventions which are being put in place which are I think absolutely critical one is the alignment of spend around uh, the skills and enterprise agency I think that's absolutely hugely important because you know, if you, if you look at the range of interventions that exist between Scottish Enterprise, SDS, uh, Scottish Funding Council, around innovation centres, you know, unless uh, unless we those are really aligned, unless there is a single mode of spend, and there isn't sort of this double or triple jeopardy that happens between different agencies, we cannot really make progress in terms of de developing new industries because this is what we need at this point in time. We do need a range of new industries developing in Scotland uh, to try and boost that that innovation and growth. And I think, you know, the, the other types of interventions, I, I, I think, are, are, it'll be interesting to see how the SNIB develops, and we'll, I know we'll get to that. But, I mean, given, because it will have to make some decisions exactly where to put some of that mission-oriented capital, what are the priorities? And that will begin to define what sits beside, you know, behind these, some of these four eyes. You know, what are the sectors in which we are going to focus? What are the areas where genuinely Scotland can be, can be you know, competitive on the world stage it's, and so on? 
also reply to that, um, I, because I have the privilege of sitting on the strategic board as well. Uh, and I know Nora Senior gave evidence to this committee um, fairly recently about the committee's work. But to reiterate what Anton has just articulated, this strategic board gives us a real opportunity to align the, the economic agencies behind Scotland's economic strategy. And when you have a situation where all of these agencies are in the same room, given the same priorities, are discussing together, are looking for hard alignment, so not just the kind of the alignment of some back office functions, but a kind of a more systematic alignment throughout their, their, their work, um, I think that gives us the opportunity to start focusing on some real issues. And I think, I, I, you know, as, as Anton has said, I think that that's a hugely important development. Okay. Thank you. If I could follow up, there's been some, uh, a lot of talk about inclusive growth, and again, it's an outcome everyone agrees with, um, and looking at this concept of a hard alignment, um, do we need a better definition of inclusive growth uh, in terms of how we measure it and how we can track progress against the objective of inclusive growth? And the reason for asking is uh, we've had the enterprise agencies and other um, panels tell us that um, they don't have a definition to work towards and inclusive growth tends to mean different things to different people. So if we are to achieve hard alignment across different agencies, don't we need a sort of clearer definition of inclusive growth and what people are actually working towards? Yeah. Come back to the points we were making earlier on about the failure of GDP to support action on inclusive growth because it doesn't take into account a lot of the problems that we see in uh, society that are preventing participation in the workforce and innovation and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. So I would certainly support us starting by looking at some of the alternative measures that measure social progress, that measure, take into account inequality across uh, life expectancy and so on, that take into account burden on the environment and so on. Things that I, I, I came across a quote recently from Robert Kennedy, who talked about the fact that GDP measured what it measured, but it doesn't measure anything that makes life worthwhile, like good environments, fairness, support for uh, people in difficulty and so on. And that, that just about sums it up. So I think the, if we change the, the metrics that we used around progress, social progress in Scotland, to include them in with uh, economic progress, and, uh, and at the same time, you would see convergence between the inclusive growth agenda and the other agendas, because it would make Scotland a flourishing country that people would want to come and live and work in. That has to be the aim. At the end of the day, that's what we want to achieve. We want people to look at Scotland and say, actually, this is a good place to live. We will come here. It's you know, I, I get invited to speak in Scandinavian countries a bit, and I always tell them that it feels like Scotland when I go to Sweden or Iceland or whatever. Um, the only difference is we've got better weather. Hard it takes to believe it, but you know, we, there is a, there's a lot that would sell Scotland if we converge these four eyes, and particularly the inclusive bit of it. Members want to come in on that point? Uh, yes, if, if I can, please. I, actually, I, it's, it's quite an interesting question because, of course, I'm so clear in my own mind what inclusive growth means, uh, uh, and I'm sure everybody has their own definition. I, th I think there is an issue about definition, which perhaps we can clarify. But I think what the agencies face, and, and I also think there's issues about measurement, which uh, Harry has just alluded to, but, but I think for the agent, from the agency's perspective, I think the, the challenge is operationalization. So once we've defined it, you know, and we, me and we have the, the measures, how do they go about operationalizing it? And I think that actually that, that kind of roadmap is probably what's also would be helpful in, in, in helping the agencies to achieve this particular goal. Your initial question actually asked about the four eyes, and it does strike me that actually one of the eyes that we haven't perhaps spoken about too much in this in this meeting is internationalisation. And I think that again, internationalisation is is one of these areas, one of the areas where the strategic board would be very would would find it very would be of help to Scotland's economic strategy simply by aligning 
some of the agencies, and, and perhaps improbably, I mean, we have a bit of an issue about exporting in Scotland. We don't do enough of it, and, and the companies that do do exporting are, are relatively few. So how do we actually go about getting more companies to export more product or more services overseas? In actual fact, some of the establishments in Scotland that are the most international are universities. And I do actually believe that universities have a very important role in helping businesses uh, to uh, internationalise. And so the alignment of the agencies, not simply the kind of, you know, the front-facing economic agencies, but also the skills agencies too, and, and education agencies, I think, I think will be, um, I think there is a, a promise of, of quite important developments there. If I can just clarify one point, in terms of taking forward the definition of inclusive growth and, and putting guidance around it, which agency will take the lead on, on that piece of work? The discussions that we've been having at the strategic board um, have included all of the agencies and we've all been discussing, discussing inclusive growth. It is my understanding that we actually have a common definition and a common understanding of inclusive growth. Maybe we need to articulate a common understanding and a common definition, and I think that that might provide more comfort and clarity for, for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gillian Martin, followed by Jamie Halker johnson Thank you very much. I have a, far too many questions. Um, but I'm going to start with some, picking up on some of the things that uh, say the Carter has said around uh, growth and the expectations of, of fast growth for, maybe by the enterprise agencies versus a, a sustainable growth. Do you think that we have got the levers to encourage uh, businesses to grow in a sustained way that's not just about the bottom line, it's not just about um, turnover? that actually looks at some of the issues we've been talking about today, about fair work, um, about work practices that are going to um, release the potential of people. Um, that, uh, that's, to me, seems to be a, a, something that's often missed by perhaps the account management process of Scottish Enterprise. I think it's a very interesting question. I mean, I think the, the, the problem with the account management uh, of, of Scottish Enterprise is that it can only include a relatively few firms. I mean, 2,000 out of 360,000 is, is not much. Uh, and of course, it's, it's uh, you know, those, those firms that are account managed are, you know, are, are rewarded by, by very important support from, from, from the agency. By contrast, I think we need to grow, as I've, I've already said, I think we need to, to grow a, a, a much larger proportion of small firms. I think almost by definition, small firms um, grow in a sustainable way. Um, they, you know, we we do rely on some fast growth firms, and we and we have seen the importance of some fast growth firms. But by far the majority, they're rare examples. The the, the majority of small firms uh, are steady, sustainable growers, uh, and it's also my belief that which is backed up by the evidence, I should say, that small firms also have a very strong interest in promoting fair work and a community orientation and are very much embedded in their local communities as well. I think one of the reasons, I think one of the levers that, that, that we have uh, that has been developed most recently, of course, has been the business pledge. And we've seen very important companies signing up to, to the business pledge one of the reasons why small firms have typically not signed up to the business pledge is not the fact that they are, are against fair work or in any way, but actually the vast majority of small firms rely on either self-employment or family labour. And it's not that they don't want to pay anybody a, a living wage, but they don't pay themselves a living wage. They, you know, they, they draw down, well, they, they take drawings, which are, is more like pocket money. And, and they benefit from, from the business in other ways, through dividends or lifestyle or whatever. But actually having that, um, the, 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 the issue of the living wage as, as being a major plank in the business pledge, possibly puts off many small firms simply because it's not relevant for them. So incentivizing enough the signing up to the business pledge, like for example, making business support be reliant on actually signing up to these. Well, I think 
we could use it more, um, I think we could be a little bit more muscular about it, but I think one of the ways that we could do it, for example, is, um, for example, in procurement and actually having the business pledge as a kind of almost a sort of a pre-qualifier for procurement, I think for, for business advice and support. But I think we also then, if we're doing that, we have to recognise that for many small firms, and it's not because they don't agree with the principles, they simply can't. Or, or in some way are hindered by, for example, you know, they, they are self-employed or they, they work with their family members, their partners or their the domestic partners, children, parents. They, the, it's in, uh, there's an informality about the labour that goes on in many small firms. By, by no means all small firms, but, but many small firms do rely on family labour and so the living wage is, is, is a big issue for them. Uh, moving on to, I mean, skills has been not mentioned as such today, but there, there's skills gaps and access to acquiring skills is an issue, and it's something that other panel panels that we've had in front of us has identified as being um, something that ha is having an impact on Scotland's economic future potentially if we don't address them. I just want to open that out just as, as a statement and get your feedback on that. I mean, I do think skills are absolutely key to. Uh, if we are to, to have that sort of virtuous cycle of, of innovation and, and new industry creation, it's going to be absolutely key to that. If you go back to actually to the 1980s and you look at why Scotland built up, say, uh, although it didn't, wasn't as long-lasting as we might have hoped, uh, strength in microelectronics, which didn't last, of course, because it was largely manufacturing as opposed to R&D, but nevertheless, it gave quite a lot of economic activity over a period of time. The reason that came here was because of the skills uh, factor. That's what attracted many of these industries here. Now, I think if you look at the sort of industries, I mean, Sarah mentioned advanced manufacturing, uh, you're looking at areas like quantum technology, you're looking at areas like life sciences. These are all levels, uh, these all require levels of very advanced skills. And it's not just graduates, uh, what we might normally see as graduate skills, it's advanced technical skills. So it's an FE as well at a more advanced level and better interface between what is happening in FE and perhaps taking that to the next stage into into graduate, into, into undergraduate uh, type training. So we need to get that absolutely right because, you know, if, if say a life science so if a life sciences cluster were to develop around, you know, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Dundee, uh, and really take off, there's no way in which, you know, that, that wouldn't demand hundreds and hundreds of highly skilled uh, people in labs. You know, we, we, we probably wouldn't be able to supply that from our existing base. So, so it's, it's going to be, I think, really important, I think, over the next while also to get that join up between FE and HE absolutely right, I think, uh, to, to try and feed uh, the industries of the future. Can I just say something about the, the lower end of the, the talent scale? Um, in as much as I've been involved in programmes like developing the young workforce and young enterprise Scotland and so on, that give kids from really difficult backgrounds access to or exposure to opportunities to work and um, mentorship and uh, and so on. It's not so. As I see it, it's not just the absence of opportunity, but what you've got are a whole cohort of young people who come from difficult homes, who are badly behaved at school, they get excluded from school, a lot of them will end up in Pullman or something like that, and as far as they're concerned, their lives are over, um, because I've spoken to them, and what are you going to do when you leave here? Well, I've got a, a criminal record, I'll never get a job, so I'll just sit at home, watch telly, and drink. Literally, I've had that said to me. And of course, the baby will come along, and there's more perpetuation of this cycle. And therefore, I think that we need to be thinking much more clearly about how we support those kids. I think excluding them from school is completely the wrong thing to do. I think that they... I know that the criminal justice system is trying very hard to find alternatives to support and social care and all this kind of thing, but we need to be thinking at that, that end as well as the kids who are getting qualifications at school and are hoping to go on to, to work. And that, because they are the ones, if we're being very, you know, there's an issue of social justice there, absolutely, but if we're being thoughtful about the cost, they are the ones that are going to cost the £1.8 billion over their life course. 
So we've got to do this across the whole of society and particularly pick up the ones who are destined to failure from an early age. Because there is a discourse um, in media and politics around productivity, meaning the bottom line, the GDP, um, and yet, it, and, and reports come out and it's always the GT, GDP that's looked at. Do you feel that we really need to shake up that discourse and actually talk about the, the how we address this from multiple interventions in a way that's actually going to benefit us? Just as you use that word productivity there, what pops into my head is the thought that actually productivity is getting the very best out of our young people. Actually, you know, looking at kids living in chaotic homes, how do we turn them into the physicists of the future? You know, why not? They've got brains as well as anyone else, but they will lose the capacity to learn and so on if we don't pick them up and, and run with them. So maybe we should set ourselves a target for making sure that no child fails. Just not acceptable. Sorry, can I also add to that? I mean, I think I, think, I have to say, I think productivity is incredibly important. Um, but I think we're starting to think about this as a trade-off and, and I don't think we should be seeing productivity growth as a tra and, and, and economic sort of equality as, 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 as a trade-off. I mean, you know, for me, as Harry has said, we actually need to make, make sure that as many people and places as possible both contribute to and benefit from economic prosperity. So for me, Productivity growth is is dependent on getting more people involved and uh, more equal access to contribute. I just have one final small question. Sorry, uh, Professor Muscatelli, you wanted to come in. Well, it, was, it was also to, to, to emphasise that actually, when you look at skills enhancement, that's exactly a way in which certainly both inclusivity and and, and growth go together. But I, I think the reason why you can't just say let's get rid of looking at productivity and GDP. I'm an economist after all. Um, why you can't is because clearly some of the things that are important to us in terms of our inclusivity are driven from that. Our tax base, for example, matters for public services. And so so I think the way to approach the problem you set out is to look at a, a sort of balanced scorecard approach. You, you, you have to look at GDP and productivity. You can't ignore it, but you look alongside a number of social indicators to make sure that you're not going in the wrong direction with some at the same time as you're improving the productivity. I just have one f final question. You all spend a lot of time visiting other countries and looking at what they do in terms of interventions. Is there anything that you would look to in another country that they're doing well that we could adopt? In um, terms of the things we've just talked about. Well, if I can start off by this, I, I mean, I think one of the, one of the um, issues that we've been looking at is obviously the OECD quartiles and the sort of the division of countries in, within in, into OECD quartiles of performance on certain measures. And for me, I I have found Ireland's performance in recent years to be quite compelling. And I think one of the um, attractive elements of Ireland, I mean, apart from the fact that they're going to benefit from Brexit, where we're handing them economic growth on a plate, um, but but up until Brexit, I think what Ireland has shown is that there are a more cohesive and a more joined up approach to a kind of a national goal of economic development. And so I think Ireland and, and probably Finland also are two countries that, are, that I would sort of look towards in terms of an alignment of agencies and a common goal. Some of the countries that came to the Inclusive Growth Conference, small countries like Slovenia, um, New Zealand, Costa Rica, very interesting country, uh, abolished its army, thereby slashing GDP because it wasn't spending money on an army. But, um, you know, beginning to pull away some of these countries that are trying all sorts of different approaches. I think I've been impressed with Sweden was also involved in, in the Inclusive Growth Conference. So yes, there are examples out there. New Zealand has just recently changed its government and I'm told that its government is beginning to think about different economic models. So yeah, there's a lot. And as I discovered when I was in, Sweden, in uh, New Zealand last year, they're all Scottish. They all, they all even, the, even the, yeah, they're all Scottish. <laughs> I mean, if I could compliment my colleagues rather than duplicating, I mean, I think 
what is happening in, in terms of the commitment towards innovation and productivity growth in areas like Germany and countries like Germany is also worth looking at. I mean, they recognize, I think some of our continental European neighbors recognize that there is a massive challenge out there with, uh, with an aging society that unless we manage to boost productivity, actually things could be really quite difficult, especially given the competition uh, globally in Asia. And I think you know their commitment to raise R&D, whether that comes from public sources or private sources, but total R&D as a proportion of GDP, I think is really quite quite staggering. And it's not only Germany, of course. Many other countries are looking at that, many smaller countries as well, some of the Baltic economies. And I think this is really important. Thank you. Jimmy Halker Johnson. Thank you just going back to the skill side, obviously last week was apprenticeship, uh, Apprentices Week, so a lot of my colleagues here will have gone out to visit companies that were uh, taking on apprentices meeting and talking about the importance, but uh, you know, there still seems to be this focus on uh, you know, university, that's the first option, and then uh, you, maybe colleges, maybe apprentice, apprenticeships after that. Do you think we value apprenticeships enough in this country? What do, you th do you think there is too much of a focus on universities? And what would the kind of recommendations that you might be giving the government on um, the importance of apprenticeships be? If I can start with that. Um, first of all, I, I will never say that there's too much focus on universities. Uh, that's uh, not something that I would agree with. But has there not been enough focus on apprenticeships? Absolutely. And I think it's the... Uh, undervaluing apprenticeships has, has, has been uh, a problem in this country and it's a, a, and it's a view that you don't see in Germany, for example, or, or those sort of technologically um, kind of competent uh, and developed countries and I, and I find that very interesting. I think the, the, the idea that universities are different from colleges from, and, and different from apprenticeships, I, I think it's quite an old-fashioned view because what I see happening in universities is I see, first of all, I see a great deal of college students articulating into universities and increasingly, of course, the, apprentice, uh, the sort of graduate apprenticeships and the apprenticeship levy has enabled universities to offer university degrees at the same time to um, uh, young people who are, who are working as apprentices and who are able to study simultaneously. And I think it's what I would see as the ideal is being a, giving equal value to the various different routes that young people pursue um, and, and an equal value to both vocational and academic uh, pursuits. But actually, it's, it's a bit of a false dichotomy, in my view, because I think universities now teach vocational, and uh, vocational c is also academic. I mean, if I could echo that, I, I, think it's, I think we could get ourselves, we sometimes get ourselves so hooked up in these definitional issues that sometimes, even if we compare data with other countries, we get into, into a rut because people say, oh, look what they're doing, and it's totally different. And actually, in reality, it's not quite as clear. I mean, I was asked uh, a similar question at the uh, House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee, where I think what I was asked, why does Singapore have fewer people going into higher education? Well, actually, when you look at what Singapore does in their polytechnics, which are now actually beginning to formalize into more of a higher education system, and we work with them as the University of Glasgow, we, we articulate, if you like, some of those students into our BSc degrees in engineering and computing science. I mean, their, their, their technical and mathematical skills in a polytechnic system are frankly as good as what we have in our higher education system. So, you know, it's a matter of definition, you know, and, and what they, I think we have to look, you know, we have to look at the whole school FEHE continuum and make sure that we've got the right skills pipeline. I think otherwise we get ourselves into a rut and say it's about pulling this lever and not that one. It, it's about getting the whole continuum right. And that's what Germany does right. That's what Singapore does right. That's what Austria does right. Can I ask that? Sorry, can I ask then? You know what discussions you've had with the, the government on this, and what, you know what advice you are giving them in terms of ensuring that that um, that that, pro that process from from school throughout the kind of education system is is working in in, in alignment. Um, well, we've certainly um, commented on the apprenticeship levy and the very positive benefits that that, that might bring. Um, our discussions have also focused on the learner journeys and, you know, sort of following um, young people through school and the different pathways to, into, into the, into the labour market. 
in actual fact, when we've taken a, a, a focus on inclusive growth, about innovation and skills, that kind of conversation really infuses all of our work. Can I also just, just very quickly ask, obviously, um, there's been uh, you know, a lot of talk kind of recently about you know, jobs are going to, you know, people aren't going to do one career necessarily throughout their lifetime. They're going to, they're going to find themselves maybe do one, two, three careers. How important it is that we, you know, we are able to meet those requirements of reskilling, retraining going forward uh, for people maybe later in life, certainly over kind of 24s, but even up to 40, 50, you know, going forward. Just one point I would make on that is there's two sides to that coin. You need to be the opportunity to retrain, but you need to have the resilience to cope with moving from one job to another and being tested like this. And, and resilience is precisely what is often missing in young people who have come from difficult backgrounds. So just time and again, we come back to this thing about supporting families, supporting young people through this journey to feel a sense of control and a sense of purpose and meaning. And uh, at the moment, I think we're making some progress, but we've got a long way to go. Right, we'll move on now to Colin Beattie. If we look across the world, I don't think there's very many countries where governments don't believe that they're in there supporting the local economy and businesses and so on. If we look at the Scottish government, what should we actually be doing either differently or uh, more of through a, directly from the government or through its agencies to directly support business in Scotland? Um, well, I think that the strategic board is addressing just those issues. And if I were to, I, I, I've, if I were to say one thing about the, the provision of support in Scotland, um, I think there is some high quality support. I'm not sure I'd say the landscape is too cluttered because that implies that there's too much and I don't think there is. I think there are still many businesses that don't benefit from support. What I would probably say is that the customer journey and helping people find their way through the landscape is actually quite hard. And so if we can simplify and clarify the customer journey I think that would help enormously. I think, I think we're doing a number of things which we discussed before. I think one thing we need to pay a, quite a bit of attention to actually is uh, simply because it's quite a big investment on our doorstep is the UK industrial strategy. It's partly about leveraging, making sure we can leverage enough money for it for Scotland because these are significant amounts. But it's also partly about to, trying to avoid uh, duplicating what is happening elsewhere. I mean, and this is what actually most small economies do quite well in Europe. I mean, if you look at Denmark or if you look at, you know, some of the Baltic economies, they look at what is happening around them. And so, you know, if the UK industrial strategy, for instance, and I'm, you know, this is just a major example, were to put a huge amount in a particular in sector X in a particular regional economy of, of England, you might say, well, actually, in reality, there's no point duplicating that. So I think we also have to be aware about how all that evolves. Uh, and it's absolutely critical to, to coordinate what we do in that sense with, with, with what happens in, in other parts and other re UK regions, because frankly, that's what other uh, small economies do, do do around Europe. Back to this question of the cluttered landscape. Um, we've heard from other witnesses giving evidence exactly the same uh, terminology. How big a problem really is that? Are there too many initiatives? Are they not joined up the way they should be? What should we be doing? I think, I think the paying attention to the customer journey will reveal how easy it is to navigate uh, the way, your way through the, through the landscape. And I think the strategic board has, it knows that it has to pay quite a lot of attention to this. In fact, the whole, that's the whole point of the strategic board is, and, and, and the alignment is, is to actually kind of clarify and simplify and, and improve the customer journey and also the learner journey as well. I, I, I'm sort of hesitant to say this too much. and I know other people do have that opinion. Because what I'm very aware of is, is businesses that don't qualify, that haven't benefited, that, that don't know how to access. And, and so I think there's a disconnect there. 
um, which I think is probably more important, and I would talk about the disconnects and how we help small firms to access the help and support that is available, because we know that there's many small firms that could benefit that currently don't. I mean, if I could comment on one aspect of, uh, of the cluttered landscape, I think one of the things we have to continuously do as new initiatives are started to try and make them coherent. I mean, I was very pleased, for instance, to see in the implementation plan for the Scottish National Investment Bank that they are talking about creating clear alignment. So, for instance, bringing into the bank uh, the, the SME holding fund, the Scottish growth scheme, so that we're not yet putting another, another element, proliferation. not proliferation. It's actually saying, okay, we're bringing in this SNIB, Let's now agglomerate everything else. And we need to do that, I think, systematically whenever new initiatives start. I think it was also good to see in the implementation for, for the bank also the fact that they're going to look at whether there are, how it relates to other lending institutions, because again, you don't want to crowd out other initiatives. You want to be, make sure that what you do is genuinely complementary and different from what banks do or the British Business Bank. Are there any specific areas where we should be doing more? I personally believe that there is a gap between startup and the account managed growth. And that's where the vast majority of Scotland's enterprises exist, and that's exactly where the gap is. <laughs> Gateway is supposed to help fill that gap. I think Business Gateway is excellent at startups, and um, but I think actually having, I'm not sure that they are able to provide the kind of support that these businesses need in order to grow, to aspire to grow and to achieve those ambitions and also to export as well, which is a, a really important part of their growth trajectory or should be. I'm not trying to place too much uh, burden on the SNIB, but actually that scale up finance of, of the order of 2 million to 10 million is exactly what you need for those companies. If there are ones that could really be promising in terms of acceleration, that's the sort of level of investment and patient investment you need, which often is very difficult to get. No bank is going to lend you that amount. You need, and, and, that, and that is, that's a part of the lending spectrum, which is actually quite difficult to access. Mm -hmm. I think it was Professor Carter that said earlier on that uh, realistically uh, the account managed companies in Scotland were about 2,000. I understand, yes. I understand there are about 2,000. Out of 350,000? 60,000 uh, enterprises in Scotland. So, so how many companies are we talking about that fall into that gap that you were describing? Well, well, that's an interesting one, because I also said that 70% of those enterprises were self-employed people, and 28% of those enterprises employ between 1 and 49. And so what we're really talking about is the, the SMEs, the, the small firms, between 1 and 49. We then have a missing middle. Uh, very few companies occupy that sort of medium size scale. And as we also noted earlier, relatively few large corporations in, in Scotland. So it's the kind of the small firms with a few employees who have the aspiration to grow, who haven't perhaps um, achieved the growth trajectory and the growth thresholds that are required in order to get them onto account management. But I actually understand that Scottish Enterprise is, has um, uh, sort of modified some of the, those thresholds because they understand that growth actually it's not linear, it's not uh, a step change, it happens quite, uh, in what sometimes looks like quite random fashion. Um, and it also isn't always sustained. So, you know, companies actually, you have to need, you, as, as I, I said earlier, in terms of the kind of the growth advantage program that we, we've developed at Strathclyde, you have to really get onto the skin of the companies to help support them to achieve those thresholds uh, and uh, achieve the, their ambitions. I can see where you're coming from. What I'm trying to get to, to understand is, what sort of resources would have to be deployed to be able to provide the support for this missing section? Now, is it 500 companies? Is it 10,000 companies? Not sure. Uh, well, I, it's, I, I, I couldn't put a, a number on it, but I mean, if we're talking about small firms um, in Scotland with a few employees, we're talking about 28% of... Uh, our, our business base. 
Um, some of those will be will have received help. Some of them won't want su support or, or help. Some of them receive help. In fact, most of them receive help from the private sector. Typically, they rely on accountants and their professional advisors. So the public sector, I think, has a really important role. But for businesses, it won't it won't be the be all and end all. And, and you won't be able to to support all of them. I mean, if you look at uh, the levels of investment that might be required, if it's a, even if it's the order of one or two million, you really are only not talking about several, probably hundreds, you know, a few hundred. But then, you know, seventy companies in in Scotland account for most of our exports. Right. You know, um, you don't actually, you know, if Scotland could double those numbers, you'd be doing, we'd be doing really, you know, much better. And the same on, on investment and innovation. Even if we could transform two hundred of those companies in that in that interval to growth companies, that would make a huge difference. panel for um, sharing their vision for the future of Scotland's economy and laying out some of the steps that need to be taken to get us there. Can I ask the panel to comment on um, to what degree Brexit is going to make that more difficult and in particular the difference between being in and out with the single market? Um, well, I, I think people know my, my view. I do think that that is absolutely critical. Uh, the, um, you know, being part of the single market is, is critical to the whole of the UK economy, actually, but particularly, I think, to certain sectors in Scotland. I mean, the, the difficulty is that, you know, with the exception of those sectors which can genuinely, and you know, sell directly into into a world market and actually, you know, have can cope with tariffs, can cope with, um, which, I, you know, you're talking about very few. Most of the sectors in the UK are really part of a value chain, and manufacturing and engineering are part of a European value chain. So not being part of the single market is a disaster because most of those value chains will, 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 will realign. Services, as you well know, are not covered by any free trade agreement that we know, not CETA for Canada or any other agreement. So unless we are members of the single market, I do think most of the you know, analysis I've seen uh, suggest that that would be pretty disastrous in terms of GDP loss. And, and we did, as part of the Standing Council for Europe, uh, see some research which then was published uh, as part of the Scotland's Place in Europe uh, jobs uh, and uh, people, jobs and investment, which showed very clearly that um, you could lose between 6.1% of GDP to 8.5% of GDP by 2030 if we're not part of that uh, single market. Um, so. And actually, that was validated by the evidence, which was uh, internal evidence to the UK government, which was leaked to, to BuzzFeed, uh, uh, which actually showed very similar numbers for, for, for the UK as for Scotland. So I think most people are agreed, most economists, 90, I, w I always tend to put a figure about 99.5% of economists agree that being part of the single market is absolutely critical to the, to, to the economic future of Scotland. And I agree. I it's nothing short of a disaster. And um, Brexit was a disaster. And the idea that we could even contemplate leaving a single market, I think, is 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 similarly disastrous. And I think to the range of industries that Anton has 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 outlined, I would also add agriculture and food and the whole idea of food security. Britain can't feed itself. We've relied on international trade to feed ourselves since for, for two hundred years. Um, the, uh, the whole idea of coming out of a single market, I, I, I feel, is extremely uh, puts us in an extremely vulnerable position. So, it's, it's my view, it's a disaster. And I'd like to hear from Harry as well, but if I could offer one more question before you comment, Harry. I mean, we often talk about the single market in the context of economic growth and trade, but it also has huge implications for social chapter rights and the security of work. Harry, I'm sure you have something to say about that. That's precisely what, what I was going to say. That is a real worry. Insecurity, housing insecurity, income insecurity and so on, is now very clear it drives bad outcomes, it drives bad health outcomes, it drives it's failure demand, it drives people into hospitals, it drives people into offending behaviour and so on. And the social protection elements of uh, that we've seen over the past 40 odd years if we lose those, it's a real problem. The other thing that worries me, and it's worried me since about nine, about 2000, when I was asked to go to a conference on the future of the American healthcare system at Stanford Business School, 
and I sat and listened for two days and the future of the American healthcare system as far as these guys saw it was to get the World Trade Organization to deregulate healthcare so that they could bid to run other healthcare systems. That was in essence what this was about and it took me a while for the penny to drop. So uh, privatisation of healthcare and so on, it, that becomes, and indeed the Prime Minister has said that she would not rule out healthcare privatisation as a discussion point in any trade deal with the United States, which is really worrying. Um, so there are a whole range of social issues that I think we need to worry about, and they might well make employment more precarious. And just finally, convener, I mean, another aspect of the single market is, of course, the free movement of workers across the European Union and the impact it has on immigration. Could you comment on uh, what that might mean for Scotland, for good or for ill? Well, sometime in the next decade, there will be more deaths in Scotland than births, and therefore indigenous population will become, the demographics will become much more difficult. And so far, immigration particularly from the EU, has been an important source of young talent. Not as far as... No. I don't think there's any evidence that, that there's, it undercuts wages. If you look at the best paper that's been written on this in terms of the impact on UK, of UK, work, on UK workers of, of EU immigration, it's a paper that was produced by the London School of Economics uh, about two years ago, looking at different local authority areas in the UK, looking at whether there was any correlation between the number of EU migrants coming in and unskilled UK workers. Zero correlation. And there's absolutely no evidence. And anybody, you know, to suggest that there is an impact, uh, frankly, is, it flies in the face of the evidence. There was one study which seemed to show some effect, and that was negated by this study by, from, the, from the LAC because what they did was to strip out uh, all non-UK workers, and then actually the impact was 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 zero. And just just to um, bring uh, a different slight angle to this, um, Germany has increased massively its exports to China, which is not in the single market over the past of course the past five years. In fact, it's become the China's largest trading partner. So, um, what is it that prevents the United Kingdom from? Uh, taking such steps in the world markets when other countries can do so. I mean, I think that's a perfect example of why any, any suggestion that it's uh, being inside the single market that's held us back is, uh, is spurious. I mean, you see other countries within Europe that have been very capable of, uh, of growing. And, and uh, you know, some of that is, is essentially to the sort of products that Germany offers, especially, especially automotive and the automotive sector and the advanced industrial sector, which China needs to tool up. Um, you know, there is absolutely no... no uh, let me put it another way, the number of trade deals that the EU has done over the last few years with third countries is huge, and those are ones that we benefit from by being inside uh, the EU. We potentially lose those if we decide to go for a, a st freestanding FTA, and I think that, is, that would be a huge loss, frankly, because the sort of deal we could negotiate with China would be, would be not on the same terms as the EU could negotiate with China. You, you, you accept that um, it's possible to... Uh, increase exports, whether you're within or without the EU? I think it's much, it's actually much easier to do it if you're part of the EU um, trade bloc, frankly, with, with third countries, including in Asia, uh, because of the, the type of deals. If you look at the deal that the, the EU has struck with Japan, with South Korea, um, and that they're likely to strike in future with, with other countries, it's, it's much better than anything that any single country can do. We're, you know, we're, we're a country of 60-odd million people. I mean, if you're a, a trading block of several hundred million people, you generally strike much better deals. And that's, that's, again, a, pretty much a given. Right. Well, we'll have to leave that discussion there. Thank you very much to our guests for coming in. I'll suspend the meeting and uh, move to the next panel. Thank you.
Well, we'll resume our session there and uh, welcome our next panel of witnesses in our inquiry into Scotland's economic performance. Now, we have, first of all, Laurie McFarlane, who is a research associate at the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Um, Kerry Sharp, who is a director at the Scottish Investment Bank, or perhaps the director at the Scottish Investment Bank, I don't know. Um, David Ovens, Chief Operating Officer, Archangels, and Peter Rieke, who is Chief Executive at the Scottish Futures Trust. So welcome to all of you this morning. Um, if I might start off with a, a, a question about the level of investment in Scotland, um, and I think it applies to the UK as well, that the level of investment is lower than in other countries. Um, could our panel perhaps comment on why this is? and how that applies to different areas. Uh, Kerry Sharp. <clears throat> so the, the challenge that we've got in data is that we don't have very many international comparators that we can look towards. The way people collect their data um, and how they publish it is, is very different across the world, so it becomes difficult for us to look at what we do in Scotland versus what um, is carried out elsewhere. But within Scotland over the last 10 years, there's been a, a massive increase in the, the funding market and the risk capital side, which is the, the side that I'm most focused on. So if we go back maybe 10 years or just uh, shy of 10 years, there was around 100 million of, of risk capital investment in Scotland. Now it's around about the 400 mark, give or take. So there's been quite a, a rapid um, increase in that area. And there's lots of different elements to it around uh, smaller businesses, and getting more funding at the sub-million level, there's quite a lot of uh, additional funding flowing into companies. Um, and also there's a number of larger investment deals as well. The last three years or so have sought more of the, the 20 million plus deal size, which is quite um, unusual. Now, Scotland has always fared um, slightly less on the bigger deal sizes. There, there's not been a proper analysis done, but about two or three years ago, we looked at what we would see as our um, comparators and looked at where we played in that market. And we needed more of those bigger deals, and we started to see that coming through over the, the last three years. So we feel now we're being a, a better player in that overall international scale. All right, thank you. Laurie McFarlane, did you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, if you look, certainly if you look at the um, available international uh, data comparing at, at an aggregate level, and inve levels of investment in Scotland and indeed the UK, um, overall level of investment has for a long time actually been uh, lower than perhaps other comparable uh, advanced economies. So in the UK and in Scotland, it's roughly uh, about 17% of GDP. Um, UK, that's 118th in the world, uh, according to the, the World Bank, which is... Uh, obviously uh, right down the lower end of, of the scale. Um, within that, of course, that's, that's overall investment, uh, public and, and business. Within that, levels of, of business investment um, are, again, in, in Scotland and the UK, relatively low. Scotland slightly lower than, than the rest of the, the UK. Um, and one of the things I think is particularly concerning, uh, if you look over the over the past 10 years, for example, again, this is this is at the UK level because the data only exists there. Um, but the level of, if you look at the level of the capital stock uh, minus depreciation, which is what you basically need to stand still, uh, on a per person basis, the growth of that has been negative since 2012, which means that we're not really, that hasn't been investing enough to really uh, m maintain the level of the capital stock at that level. Um, which I think is concerning uh, and, and, and has links to other, other issues like productivity, etc. Um, I also think that within that uh, level of, of investment, um, again, just looking internationally, uh, one thing that stands out is particularly low level of, of R&D level of investment, which I think we've heard about in, in previous panel sessions, um, where, again, the UK stands out as being low. It's been falling for the past 30 years, and Scotland within the UK uh, lower within that, and obviously there's lots of evidence that R&D investment is, is, is important for a whole, whole, whole range of things from uh, innovation, productivity, etc. Um, so certainly I think that overall when you look just at the broad brush picture, um, that, that there, there is the case that Scotland's level of investment is, is, is perhaps lower than other, other countries. I think it's important to ask why that is, uh, and if it's an issue, and if it is, uh, what we should be doing about that. And, and do you have any ideas why that is? So I think there are a whole range of uh, 
contributing factors. Um, one what that's, that's often pointed out is the industrial structure of Scotland's economy and the UK's economy uh, being very different to other countries. So, for example, people will point to Germany and look at, look at there, which is much higher level of manufacturing, tends to have much higher levels of investment uh, and capital equipment than a services-based economy does. Even when you look at that and you adjust for that, though, um, it still does stand out as being perhaps uh, a bit lower uh, than, than other countries. Um, other, other issues I think we might come on to talk about as well, uh, issues to do with, with, with finance uh, and, and the availability of finance and the type of finance available. Um, there's also some evidence to suggest that uh, the kind of corporate governance arrangements, in, particularly in the UK uh, and, and, other, and in the US as well, um, has been focusing, uh, has incentivized the focus on the short, ter short term rather than longer term investment, uh, which is uh, which has incentivized companies to, to, to put off perhaps longer investment decisions in favor of doing things like share buybacks and things like that. Um, and I do think as well that there's also just the, the issue, which is that companies will, uh, businesses will invest if they are um, on the basis of future growth opportunities, if they feel they are, if they are excited about opportunities, identify areas to make investments that they think they can make profits out of. Um, and it's about that kind of animal spirits of business. And I do think that in, in Scotland and in the UK, that in some cases, I think it's got better at this over recent years by some of the interventions that have taken place. But actually getting that, uh, unleashing that animal spirits of firms who want to are willing to enable to grow and expand and innovate, I think, is something that perhaps we don't do quite as well as we do uh, in other countries. Right, thank you. Would either of the other, Peter Rieke and then David Owens. Well, I can speak more for infrastructure <coughs> investment and public investment than, than anything else. And similar to the, the panel earlier this morning, that's obviously been hit very significantly since the global economic crisis, 2007-8. Um, and since that point in time, the the public budgets for spending on infrastructure dropped very significantly and we have been using in Scotland all the available levers that we have to try and maximise infrastructure investment because of the impact it can have on the economy both in the short run and in the, the medium to longer term although the, 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 the short run impact is supported by a lot more people than the longer run impact which is questioned by some people we can maybe come back to that if you wish but things like um, tax increment financing and the, the non-profit distribution program have been have been put in place to, to try and, as I say, use all available levers to maximise investments during that period. And Scotland's got a reasonably good regional performance. Um, the OECD report on transport said that in, in 2016 it was the, the region outside London that had the most investment. Um, Graham's own Fraser um, commentary showed that in 1415, the construction industry in Scotland was particularly strong, and that was driven by public sector um, infrastructure investment. And it is a, across all of the areas where the public sector spends and invests money, it has a particularly high multiplier effect. So it is a, is a, a good thing to invest in and spend money on to get that short-term economic effect. And the, the longer-term impact of that investment is much more particularly characterised by the need to make the investment in the right thing. So short-run economic impact of, of investment in infrastructure activity, um, the, the Keynesian effect, if you like, is, is much the same whether you're digging holes and filling them back in again or whether you're rolling out broadband infrastructure um, across, across the country. The longer, medium and longer-term um, impact is massively greater, I would suggest, if, if we make great investment decisions about where to focus that infrastructure investment and things like decarbonising to transform the economy and on our digital connectivity, where there's some very strong links in the, for example, in the information that the OECD gave you on the, um, the correlation between broadband and mobile connectivity and productivity. So we, we can definitely make the best of that investment by doubt in the right place. And finally, I would say that that's not just to say that connectivity is everything in that investment. Affordable housing can be a, a, a big barrier to an economy in a particular place. Um, and, and the social infrastructure is really important for, um, for the inclusive growth that we've talked about and for 
particularly young people and creating aspiration through having great places to to learn so across all of those different areas infrastructure investment can do a lot for the economy and for inclusive growth but targeting it in the right place is um, what SFT is particularly engaged in and a lot of other people are as well and making to, that will give our maximum benefit over the medium to longer term as well as just the short term impact. David Owens. Yeah, can I just pick up on Laurie's point on R&D? Um, I think one of the things that we do really well in Scotland is R&D to the universities. We've got some world-class universities there. Problem is, though, that R&D can take a long time to commercialise, uh, and therefore it's, you know, for, for conventional providers of capital, so think private equity, think venture capital, um, think corporates, it's not an area that they necessarily want to invest in because they require a return on their investment. Um, and from our own track record uh, as investors in early stage R&D companies, you know, it can actually take 10 years plus to, to get a company from the stage where it's developing an interesting piece of disruptive technology uh, to the point where that technology reaches uh, maturity uh, or the company in which we're investing reach, reaches commercial maturity. Um, I would echo Kerry's point about levels of investment within the early stage risk capital market, which is where we operate. Uh, and over the, the last 10 years or so, we have seen an increase, actually, in uh, investment capital in that area. Partly that's driven by um, the establishment of the Scottish Co-Investment Fund uh, back in 2003. Uh, and I think what we've seen is that that has leveraged in, crowded in, uh, an additional number of private sector players. So, so if you go back to 2003, there were half a dozen or so uh, business angel syndicates operating in the market, and, and these are the people who invest in early stage technology businesses. Um, this year, there are around 20 or so. Um, and with my Link, Scot Link Scotland's umbrella organisation for, for business angel syndicates in, in Scotland, um, if you go back to um, the point where uh, the Scottish Co Investment Fund was established, um, Link, which probably accounts for about a third of the investment activity in the sector, was doing around £10 million of investment activity in the sector. In 2017, um, it was doing £50 million. So you can see that this sort of policy intervention has had quite a significant impact. But I think the fundamental problem is that R&D takes a long time to commercialise, uh, and therefore if you're going to encourage investment into the sector, you do need policy intervention in the <coughs> sector. Thank you. And John Mason. Thanks, Convener. I mean, I think following on from the Convener's questions, maybe I can just seek a little bit of clarification because I, I feel I'm getting a little bit of a mixed message here. And I was especially thinking, you know, did the financial crisis have a big impact? And Peter Rieke specifically said it did and that things had been bad since then. But Kerry Sharp, you were saying that over the last 10 years, there's been this increase from, what, 100 million to 400 million investment. And then um, uh, David Ovens, I think you, you said since 2003, there's been a kind of increase and, and was that dented by the financial crisis, or was that... I mean, I'm just trying to get a, get a picture for the whole thing over the last 10 years. I, I think you've got to look at the sort of stages of company evolution. Um, so um, we invest at a very early stage in a company's evolution. So typically for us, it will take about 10 million of investment capital to get a company to the point where um, the technology is mature enough, the company is commercially mature enough for other sources of more conventional capital to be interested in that company. So it's within that specific context, with that specific space, where we've seen an increase. Um, I think undoubtedly we have seen a decrease overall in the level of capital investment into to businesses, so specifically into more mature businesses. I would just add to that that the financial crisis had a huge impact on banks and the debt market, and it did have an impact on the equity market, but not as much. Obviously, equity is high risk, so you're, you're taking on board uh, the risks that exist in the market to invest through equity. So we're talking about maybe slightly different things there as well. And I'm sure you're all aware of the impacts on public budgets of, of the global financial crisis and the, the, the time taken to, to recover. And just last year or so, um, there have been some more significant increases in capital budgets, um, but, but until then, there has been an impact on public and the capacity to invest. I mean, has, has the change in rules had an impact as well? Because, you know, I understand that what... That, I mean, a lot of PFI, all of these schemes were to get things off 
the, the public balance sheet, and I think that's affected Scottish Futures Trust as well, NPD, so on. Has that had an, an overall effect, or has that just worked its way through the system? Well, the, the programmes of activity, the NPD and the Hub Design, Build, Finance and Maintain, were, were de designed to deliver additionality of investment. And I've said here before that the, the rules changed in respect of NPD has stopped that being the case. So, yes, there, there is an impact on, on additionality of, and the capacity to invest over and above um, capital budgets. But, but we also need to be very mindful of affordability as well. So it's not something that you can just keep on doing forever in that way. And there's also the, the, um, the Scottish Government, as you may know, has set this, the, the long-term cap on um, repayments of 5% for that sort of capital investment pay through for long-term revenue budget. So it's a balance between those two things. I mean, one of the suggestions we've had is that there just there seem to be so many schemes and so many ways of additionality as well as your traditional funding that especially small businesses may be confused by the whole landscape. And I think Nora Senior touched on that when she was here. Um, you know, is it your feeling then that the, 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 the whole play, the marketplace is too complicated or, or is, that, is that being overstated or is it, does it affect different companies differently? So if I can maybe take that, certainly from a, from a small company point of view, it can be challenging understanding the landscape and we are very aware of that. Uh, you know, obviously companies range from very little knowledge of finance at all through to, you know, quite a lot of experience. But even when you know a lot about it, the difference between debt and equity and the like, it can still be difficult for companies to understand where to go. Um, so across the public sector in particular, we've tried to take a lot of action in making it more streamlined, making it easier for customers to understand. <coughs> We're taking a lot of uh, digital approaches forward to try and allow that kind of customer journey that we talked about earlier so that companies can see where they need to go. Um, but there's no doubt that um, there is complexity there. But ultimately, it's around trying to provide as many different products and interventions to support as many different companies as possible. So by nature of that, there's a lot there's a lot out there. And I think um, certainly the public sector, and, and we try to work closely with the private sector on this as well, the need is to coordinate and align what we do rather than you know take things away, because ultimately there are going to be companies that, that lose out if that's the case. Is that your view, Mr. Evans, as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, so what I would say is that there are lots of effective interventions out there. So Scottish Co-Investment Fund, from an investment perspective, is certainly one of those. The account management system within SE is definitely one of those two. But I think the dots could be joined up a bit better, and I think the whole thing could be simplified from a company perspective. But certainly the interventions that are there are largely effective. So you wouldn't take it anyway? No, I would add two. Okay, right. Thank you. And Colin Beattie. A number of witnesses have uh, felt that Scotland lacks ambition. Do you agree with that? And if so, why? Well, it's a difficult one. So, does Scotland lack ambition? No, in terms of the... the entrepreneurs that we back and the, the business plans that we see, there's certainly a lot of ambition there. I think entrepreneurs need the support to, to get there. So, so if, if I take a step back, um, we're talking about GDP growth and, you know, and how you get GDP growth. And effectively, we're looking to, to expand the productive capacity of the economy in Scotland. And that means um, increasing the number of companies that are exporting and increasing the, the number of well-paid jobs. So, so adding to the pool of people who, who are in that sort of higher and additional uh, tax band. The way you do that, and I think Dean touched on this earlier, was um, I think we need uh, an industrial strategy within Scotland, which links into the, to the UK context. But I think we need to look at the specific sectors within Scotland where we can, which have the capacity and the ability uh, to provide those additional high paid jobs and, and to, to produce those companies that are exporting. So you need a, a specific strategy within all of those. Um, and then you need intervention from the public sector to, to help address the, the, the deficiencies within the, the, the specific sectors. Within technology, um, I think there's a lot of ambition, but there are specific market failures which need to be addressed. And, and the biggest challenge is in the provision of scale-up capital. Um, I am encouraged by the ambition of what Ben Higgins set, set out uh, in his implementation paper for SNIB. And I, 
I think if that's implemented with the ambition that he set out, I think it could be a really useful uh, intervention. Um, so, no, I don't think uh, there is a lack of ambition in Scotland, but I think we need to be better in encouraging and facilitating uh, the people with ambition to grow their companies. Just add to that, I mean, certainly the, um, the companies that Archangel and ourselves invest into are, are ambitious companies, um, but there are, I think, outside that, a number of challenges that exist as well. Um, we can get frustrated sometimes when we, products that are that are put to the market and the, the demand for them isn't as much as we'd like it to be. Um, and certainly one of the big discussions as part of the, the National Investment Bank discussion was around that supply of finance is very important, but as is the demand. So having the vision behind the companies and also their investor readiness to be able to access the capital. Um, and there was a report out um, a couple of weeks ago from the British Business Bank that looked at uh, companies, uh, smaller companies and their financing needs and one of the stats that jumped out to me was that 70% of companies don't want to take on any funding to grow their business and they're happy to take uh, less growth in their business rather than take on external funding. Now that, that's that's not good. Uh, and th is that lack of ambition, is that um, discourage borrowers, is that issues with how they think they'll be treated in the market, it's difficult to know, but there's something that we need to look at around that that demand side and making sure we can create that and, and deal with that in a way that when there is supply interventions there, the companies can get the funding and, and grow to the success of the economy. Well, I'm pleased there's a bit more optimism here about the ambitions of Scottish companies, but leading on from what you both said there, presumably there's a, a reasonable supply of funding for these companies. No? This is where I think you need to look at the specific industry sectors and really drill down and understand where the market failures are. And if you look at the, the technology sector, um, one of the things we've done really well in Scotland is to develop an ecosystem where um, somebody who wants to commercial, commercialise R&D can get the first chunk of funding. So we've got a really good ecosystem. Uh, Scottish Enterprise play, plays a large part in that. And if you want to raise the first two million of capital, you can do it relatively uh, easily in the Scottish context. However, um, we've invested for 25 years in innovative companies, and it takes more than two million pounds to, to get a company which has interesting uh, technology to the point where it's commercialising that interesting technology. And it can take up to, to 10 million pounds. And if I give you two specific examples from within our portfolio. Um, Touch Bionics, um, we um, invested in in 2003, and that was literally an idea, a concept. It was a spin-out from the Scottish Health Service in 2003. Uh, they do prosthetic, upper prosthetic limbs, bionic arms and hands. Um, we put £12.5 million of investment capital into that company over a 13-year period uh, to get that to the point where it was of interest to a, a purchaser. Optos PLC, which created a, a retinal scanning device, again, was a, a piece of paper and an idea back in 1992. That took £38 million of investment capital over a 14-year period before it listed on the London Stock Exchange. And it's now employing 400 people uh, worldwide, 200 of those in, in Dunfermline. Now, the problem is that, the, as we talked about earlier, the investors in this early stage technology space are largely high net worth individuals, so it's business angel syndicates effectively. And the, the problem we have is that these individuals can only go so far. So without policy intervention uh, that allows them to go further, uh, you've got a real issue in, in you know, companies which are innovative, or which are high growth potential, which could be the exporting uh, companies of the future. They're just not able to access the capital that they need to do that. So the specific gap in the market now, which has been identified through the, the SNIB implementation report, is really that two to ten million pounds of investment capital. Uh, and there's not enough of that in the market in Scotland just now. So are you saying the government should be providing that? No. I, I, I think the government should encourage the private sector to, to provide that. And if you look at how that's done in terms of policy intervention currently. Um, so at the UK level, um, our investors are uh, incentivised, if you like, through uh, tax incentives. Uh, and the main one of those is the EIS scheme, Enterprise Investment Scheme, but there are others, VCT uh, rules. Um, and at the local level, um, the investment which we make is leveraged 
uh, by uh, Kerry and her colleagues through the Scottish Investment Bank. Now, where I, I'm really encouraged by um, Benny's report and SNIB is that we're now looking at that sort of two to ten million pounds gap, uh, and we're saying, well, we can leverage further and try and crowd in the private sector uh, to, to, to address that specific uh, market failure. So, based on what you're saying now, would you say that uh, there's a disconnect between supply of finance and demand for finance? Is that universal, or is it just sectoral? Uh, well, sir, sir, I, I can talk for the technology sector. That's my <laughs> area of expertise. And in the early stage technology uh, sector in Scotland, uh, the supply of capital does not meet the demand for that capital. If I could just maybe add to that, um, I think it's important to make the distinction between quantity of finance and quality of finance. I think, in generally speaking, in Scotland and the UK, there's lots of finance. Um, uh, you know, we've got one of the largest financial sectors in the world relative to the size of our uh, economy. Um, much of that is doing things like mortgage lending or intra-financial lending or other things. Um, what we really don't have much of is the kind of finance that's been identified by David, which is the kind of long-term, patient, committed finance that's needed, uh, that's particularly important for innovation. Um, and if you look, again, just cross countries and other places that, that have been particularly successful at this, um, what you see regularly is there's been a really important role for public policy and actually for uh, early stage public funding, the places who have really flourished in terms of having uh, smart innovation-led economies, um, whether that's been through research and development agencies in, in the US, whether it's been through public venture capital funds like Yosma in Israel, whether that's been through state investment banks, like in many European countries, um, these institutions have been critical in fostering that kind of, uh, catalyzing that kind of um, uh, in, in, innovation. Um, and so I think it's, we should be focusing on the, the quality uh, as it applies to specific areas of the economy rather than the overall quantity of finance that's, that, that we see in the economy. You made reference there to patient finance. Previous witnesses have talked about the distinction between providing equity capital and providing debt. Is that, is that an important factor for you as well? So, so certainly um, equity and debt are very different for different purposes, but both of them can be patient in their own right, or either of them can be patient in their own right. So I think when we talk about patient capital here, it is equity in the main that we're referring to and that, that later stage. So the challenge that we have in the market, and back to some of the earlier points, is a lot of the funding that is, is provided when it is provided is through closed-end funds. So there's always a timeline you know, for, for funding to come out because investors need to make their, their money, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it in the first place. A lot of funds are around 10 years, sometimes a little longer, but it can take longer than that. I mean, the, the examples David used earlier, you know, just now, and again, the British Business Bank report talked about exits are 10 years plus. That we used to talk about five to six to seven years, and you know, the last number of years it's been 10 years plus, and that doesn't suit a lot of funds. So, there's a need to have capital that, that doesn't need to follow that life cycle that can be there longer to support the companies through the growth trajectory. Because ultimately, for companies, they need to have choices for growth. Um, and if, if the, the funding, the equity funding is taken away, then they have limited choices. And they either need to sell or they need to IPO, which might not be right for the business if they want to grow. So ultimately, what we need in Scotland is a number of different players with uh, different types of instruments, different types of um, capability when it comes to how patient they're able to be to ensure that our companies can pick and choose rather than going with whatever's available in the market. Will SNIB be providing equity capital? Was uh, recommended in the implementation plan, and clearly that's Benny's plan to to government to uh, to decide what to do. But certainly, if that's implemented um, in in the, the form set out, then that that definitely looks like something we'll be doing. Julian Martin, convener. We've had a few witnesses in front of us that have actually said that because of the financial crash, that high street banks are not fulfilling the role that they used to anymore in terms of supporting small businesses in particular, startups in particular. Um, other countries have been mentioned as doing things a little bit better than us, for example, Germany. And of course, Germany still has the Sparkasse model, which provides locally focused, uh, not-for-profit type 
assistance, loans, not just in the domestic market, but in uh, for, for business as well. Ireland are looking at adopting the Spark as a model. Should we? Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. So I think firstly, um, you mentioned the shift in the banking sector in the UK since the financial crisis. I think there's a kind of a longer trajectory of shifts that actually precede the financial crisis where the, 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 move, the, the shift and consolidation in the, in the UK banking sector, um, whereas previously we had uh, quite a lot of different players regionally, locally focused, different models, more building societies, uh, savings banks, uh, trusts, etc. Uh, a lot of that kind of consolidated and we've now in a position where it's quite a consolidated sector dominated by a, a, a few uh, high street banks. Um, and, and again, you mentioned that's very different to what's, uh, what is the case in other countries. Germany is, is perhaps the, the, the biggest example on the other end where you have a large proportion of the banking sector is, uh, orient is focused with public savings banks, the Sparkassen, which are kind of a network, a decentralised network of publicly owned institutions, and they provide kind of the backbone of SME lending, actually, in the German Mittelstand, which is the, the kind of heartland of SMEs, the, the kind of industrial heartland of Germany. There's also quite a vibrant cooperative banking sector um, in Germany, as well as your commercial banking uh, sector as well. Um, uh, and I do think it's important to highlight the, 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 the shift in the UK away from what used to be kind of relationship-based lending, if you like, where you could go, you'd have a relationship with your branch manager who would have the power to make decisions and would make decisions based on the relationship with the business. And a lot of that is kind of shifted in, in favour of centralised credit scoring. Um, and there's, there is evidence to suggest that that kind of shift amplifies the market failure, which has long been identified with SME lending, with information asymmetry between firms and lenders, um, by doing away with that kind of softer information exchange um, uh, that you have in, in banks. And, and today, if you look at what banks actually do in the UK, high street retail banks, um, very little of their lending is actually for business. Uh, according to the Bank of England, 4% of all bank lending is for SMEs. Um, uh, and, and less than 10% for what you might call real economy business. So non-real estate related, non-financial sector related lending. It's a very small part of what banks do. There's been a, a, quite a big shift. Um, and indeed, a lot of this does precede the financial crisis. Since the financial crisis has been, obviously, there was the, the credit crunch, a real, a real pulling, pulling back from lending uh, of all kinds, including to business uh, and, and mortgage lending and other kinds. And that has started to recover somewhat now um, lending to, to, to non-financial corporations has turned positive again in the last few years. Um, but certainly I do think that uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to look at how different types of institutions perhaps serve different types of customers better uh, and what we can learn from other countries in doing that. We do have a situation where, of course, we're, we're having high street banks closing their branches on the one hand, so it's affecting domestic customers. There's also the, the, the gap that's been identified by yourselves, but also by, by people in previous months, where there's a, a gap in terms of the, the support, the actual financial support and lending given to SMEs. So I, I would be interested to hear from other panel members whether you think that there is that gap in the market on both sides that could be filled by something that is a kind of not, not for profit kind of model and, and regional lending that the Sparkassa uh, gives Germany. So um, one thing I would say in that is certainly um, the evidence that we've got suggests that companies looking to borrow less than a million pounds is certainly a challenge. It's the most difficult area of lending to get. So there's no doubt that that is, is a bit of a challenge. But you know, one of or two of the things I think behind that we need to be in mind is obviously companies to be viable to be able to get uh, funding in the first place. And one of the questions always if, if that's the case for you know a lot of the companies that are unsuccessful. Um, but the other point is if loans need to be paid back, that's just you know the, the nature of them. Um, and it's not always appropriate, particularly for early stage and startup companies, for, for loans to be the right instrument. So um, equity, obviously we, we've mentioned a lot um, already, is, is clearly a product um, or a, an instrument that's there that could be more appropriate for companies than lending. Um, and also a number of grant um, interventions from Scottish Enterprise and others that could also support whether there's a, a particular need for non-profit making um, intervention. I don't know the answer to that. 
that. But I guess as a as public sector, we would always start in, in not non-profit making, um, given there's a need for public sector resources to be returned and to, to be then recycled into other areas. Um, but certainly we recognise that area in the debt market is something that needs to be looked at. And again, it is mentioned in the Scottish National Investment Bank implementation plan, is that lower level of debt, uh, they, they want to look at that and see what can be done. Scottish Enterprise and Account Management, we've already heard from other panels, many other panels, that there is often barriers in place. And particularly, women-led businesses are not getting the same kind of equity in terms of access to uh, business support from these larger agencies. Do you not think that there is a, a real gap in terms of support of that type? Type, sorry. Of of uh, financial assistance for women -led. business business advice <laughs> that could be filled by something like uh, a not for profit bank. I'm, so, so I'm going to come back to if, if we're talking about policy intervention, I think policy policy should intervene where there is a market failure. Um, and as Kerry made the point. Uh, Debt is an appropriate uh, funding instrument for companies which are mature, which can service that debt. And, 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 and therefore, you know, we have big banks in the UK, we should be capable of filling that gap. I think where the real market failure is, is in the equity capital space. So um, for R&D companies, uh, th th they're not generating, I mean, they're, they're not generating turnover for the first <laughs> few years, but, but even then, you know, when they start to generate turnover, uh, they tend not to be profitable for a long period of time and therefore the appropriate financial instrument for those companies is equity rather than debt. So, so I think SNIB, I think the focus of SNIB should be on equity rather than debt. Um, on your point to, to women entrepreneurs, um, I would say a quarter of our portfolio is, is led by uh, female CEOs, so um, we see ambition across the spectrum. Thank you. Dean Lockhart. Uh, the SNIB has been launched and uh, quite a lot of uh, publicity are surrounding the launch of the SNIB. Panel members have uh, discussed it. It's uh, committing to invest hundreds of millions of pounds in the Scottish economy and Scottish business. Um, 18 months ago, we saw the Scottish Growth Scheme being launched with a similar commitment to invest, I think, up to 500 million pounds in um, the Scottish uh, business community. But, but so far, it's only invested I believe 25 million pounds uh, of the half billion pounds commitment. C can I ask the panel uh, for views uh, or insights as to what reasons are behind that very limited investment from uh, the Scottish Growth Scheme into, into expanding businesses? So, do you want me to, to start? So, um, I think it's fair to say that with any new initiative, it takes time uh, for funding to be um, invested. So um, I'm sure that the Scottish Growth Scheme, like any other scheme that's launched, uh, will be kind of subject to that. Certainly, we've benefited um, twice now from funding through the Scottish Growth Scheme, um, and one of the one of the um, things was for our Scottish European Growth Co-Investment Programme, which so far hasn't invested any of the, the funding that the Scottish Government has committed to it, but that is just the nature of, of the programme. It's a new programme. It's with uh, alongside the EIF. It's in that scale-up capital space, so it's particularly relevant at the moment, but there's nervousness from companies and from investors with Brexit and, and other things. And just by, again, nature of the, the programmes, you know, different, it's new, it's first in class, it's never been done um, before, we're the first in Europe to do it. It's just taken time to educate the companies, speak to the investors. There's been a lot of inquiries, a lot of discussions with, um, with investors, and, and we're very hopeful that we're going to be um, starting to spend some of that Scottish Growth Scheme money soon. Would, uh, would there not be similar concerns surrounding the Scottish National Bank? We understand the Scottish Growth Scheme is going to be uh, taken under the umbrella of the Scottish National Investment Bank. So what can we do to prevent similar issues arising uh, when the uh, SNIB is, is implemented? And I guess a supplementary question is, is it a lack of demand uh, from bus exp expanding businesses we're seeing? Is that part of the reason why there wasn't a, a stronger uptake on money available under the Growth Scheme? So 
Oh, I don't think there's anything we need to prevent as such. Um, I think it's just nature of funding being available, that it takes a while for companies to understand it's there, to understand what it, what it is, to make sure that they're investor ready to be able to, to access it. So it's just that the, the nature of any new funding instrument ne means the demand needs to, to be um, either upskilled or um, set alongside it from the point of view of being ready to access it. So I'm not seeing it as a, an issue to be avoided with the new National Investment Bank, but certainly something to be very aware of that things don't happen overnight. It takes time. Thank you. Can I uh, move on to uh, another discussion about expanding business? A lot of the discussion so far has understandably been about finance. Um, what other challenges do expanding business fa face in, in Scotland? What, what, what do you typically see as the barriers to companies moving from where they are right now to expanding their business or moving into the export market? And if I could ask, what policy responses work best to address those challenges? So, so when we look to invest in companies, um, I suppose the three aspects for us are um, the, the product and the, the, the sort of market that that product, the market need that that product is addressing. So, so it needs to uh, address a specific market need. We're not particularly interested in things that are trying to create a new market. Um, we then look at the quality of the, the management team. Um, so, so the access to capital is a given because if we make a decision to invest, we'll support that company for the duration. However, the biggest challenge that companies typically have is that if they're moving from that R&D phase through to commercialization phase, uh, the skill set that they need, that the individuals running the business need to do that changes uh, over time. So, so access to talent uh, is therefore one of the key uh, challenges which companies face. Um, and I think as, as we, we breed success with an ecosystem, companies like Skyscanner, we're certainly see, seeing uh, that sort of talent re-emerging in different you know, guises within the sector. Um, and we do have support, significant support from SE in that regard too. So given certainly through our model, um, we work alongside private sector investors like David, so it wouldn't surprise you that I agree with um, all that he said there. Um, certainly the funding, we always see it as absolutely critical, but alongside that is, is the skills, and that includes um, the skills within the, the company itself, but leadership skills as well. Obviously growing a company, um, particularly a global company, takes a lot of um, you know skills and expertise, and being able to either locate them in Scotland or being able to to bring skills in and to be able to recycle those skills within our company base and, and the new opportunities is really important. So certainly within Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands and Enterprise, there's a, a number of leadership support schemes, which I think um, are, are critical to enable the companies to be able to, uh, you know, to, to grow and to, to start to export and to become global companies in due course. Thank you. And one final question, if I may. Um, the use of, sort of digital technology with companies, and, and David, I think you said you focus on uh, technology companies, but I guess this is more not, not a sector question. It's more the use of e-commerce uh, in companies. Um, do you think Scotland has the right um, policies in place, and are you seeing businesses using e-commerce enough, both for the domestic market and for, for the export markets, or do you think there's much more that could be done when it comes to uh, companies and the business community using e-commerce? Well, I think e-commerce is fundamental to, to growing companies. I think if you looked at the sort of patient capital review that the UK government uh, initiated, they looked at cohorts of um, 1998 companies and looked at you know which of those companies had grown over a 15-year period. Uh, and it was a very small number, but the key driver there was adoption of new technologies and adoption of digital processes within the business. So, so I think as a driver for growth, I think it's really important. Um, you know, I'm pro probably not qualified to, to comment on the, the sort of policy position, but, but obviously access to broadband is, uh, is critical to that and connectivity. Yeah, and certainly on the question over, um, you know, are we doing enough? Then I don't think we are. I think there's a long way to go. Um, I agree with David entirely that, you know, the future is, is very uh, much digital based. And within Scottish Enterprise, we're seeking to, to support a number of companies in that that move. Digital first is, is, is what we name it, both within Scottish Enterprise itself and also in support of our companies. There's definitely a need for us across the economy to really embrace digital and what it can do for us. And I think when we do that, the um, the benefits we'll get from it will be dramatic as the economy starts to grow. Okay, thanks very much. Andy Whiteman. 
Uh, thanks very much, Convener. The, the focus of this inquiry includes identifying challenges and opportunities facing the Scottish economy over the next 10 years um, and what actions required to make the economy more inclusive, innovative and international. So we do want to take a view on what we see as the role being uh, played by the Scottish National Investment Bank. In that respect, uh, Laurie McFarlane, I'd be interested in your views, having looked at these institutions, um, what lessons we can learn from other state investment banks and what we as parliamentarians in this economy committee should be looking most particularly at as the Scottish National Investment Bank uh, develops. Thanks. So, um, so part of the work that uh, we've been doing at IIPP uh, has been around looking at the role of state investment banks as they, as they exist in other countries around the world and what we can learn from that. Um, and one of, the, one of the key things straight away that you notice a difference between um, is institutions that are sometimes called mission-led, um, which are focused on specific challenges or problems um, that have been identified in that country which drive the activity of the institutions. Um, so you have that on the one hand, and other institutions which have a more static uh, mandate, like focusing on things like uh, com competitiveness or growth. Um, the difference being in institutions that, that, are, that have directionality built into them, if you like. So they're not just about uh, fostering growth or innovation, it's about having a directionality to that growth and innovation. So um, what kind of growth and what kind of innovation? Um, so just to give one example, uh, one of the, the, the kind of most successful banks, obviously, is the German KfW, um, and they have three what they call uh, mega trends, grand challenges, which really steer the activity of that bank. Uh, one being climate change, um, about 35% of all the uh, investment done by the KfW is, uh, is, is sort of orientated around that mission. Um, that doesn't just mean investing in green sectors or uh, traditionally, you know, renewable energy. It, it also means actually uh, working with firms like steel, other industries, in order to, to, to kind of green their activities. Uh, and the other kind of mega trend that we focus on is um, demographic pressures, aging population, um, and, and how, how the German economy can adapt to uh, different demographic pressures. Um, and the other one is around technological pro progress and international competitiveness as well. Um, and certainly this kind of, uh, this kind of approach uh, of being mission-led, rather than either being static, uh, focused on sort of growth and competitiveness, or indeed picking specific sectors, uh, can be very successful in fostering uh, growth and innovation, um, while avoiding some of the pitfalls that some institutions, uh, banks and other institutions, have succumbed to if you focus on a purely sector focus, where you say, we're going to pick this specific sector and this is what we're going to support, which can have its drawbacks uh, in particular. Um, so I think that's really, really important. I think other things to, to, uh, to bear in mind, we already talked about having uh, different types of instruments uh, available to uh, at the disposal of the bank. and. If you're going to play a wide, if you're going to have a wide remit and play quite a significant role in the economy, it's important to have different types of instruments to match different types of projects in different areas uh, of the of the risk landscape. And certainly, the implementation plan published by Benny Higgins did set out the ambition of being able to offer uh, a wide range of different instruments in order to support uh, investments uh, in line with the in line with the different missions of the bank. Um, one thing I think in terms of what to, what to look out for, I mean, it, it is clear in the implementation plan that uh, the ultimate remit uh, and missions of the bank will be set by the Scottish Government. Um, there were some recommendations in the report around uh, low carbon economy, around demographic things, about local regeneration and placemaking as being potential candidates for that. I think the process by which the, uh, the missions of the bank are set uh, and how they're monitored, evaluated, uh, and assessed over time is an issue that uh, will need to be considered. There's a recommendation in the implementation plan that the government should set up an advisory, stakeholder advisory group to feed into that process, uh, which I think is an interesting uh, development as how do you engage wider uh, civic society in the discussion around what a bank like this should be focusing on as its priorities. So I think that's something that should be, will be interesting and, and maybe something to think about. Other observations, or that, I'm content with that answer. I mean, I'm, I'm particularly interested in 
the extent to which um, we build in flexibility for such an institution and the extent to which we build in some kind of democratic parliamentary oversight of such an institution. Have you got any thoughts on that? Certainly from a flexibility point of view, I, I think it's, it's fundamental. <clears throat> I mean, one of the things that we we all try to do in, in this area is work at where the gap is. And we, we kind of like it to, to be something and have a start and an end and, and be able to describe it. And the reality is it doesn't work like that at all. The gaps are evolving all the time and the parameters are changing all the time. And it's very important to have a support mechanism which adapt either just to that, that evolving uh, kind of nature of the gaps or when something Something happens, you know, from left field that's not expected to be able to, to get round about it very quickly and provide some to support companies rather than go through a whole kind of process of identifying the gap and, you know, being able to, uh, to get support. So for me, flexibility um, within the model is going to be a huge thing to, to make it successful. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, Gordon MacDonald. I just wanted to ask a question. We heard witnesses this morning tell us that there's a lack of medium-sized companies in Scotland. Uh, we've got about half a percent of large companies, over 250, um, but there is this big gap between small companies and large. There's no medium-sized companies. And if I understood um, David Owens, um, research and development startups to commercialisation takes about 10 years. Uh, and there comes a point when investors want a return on their money, and I think the quote was when it's attractive to a buyer. Um, can you say something about what the benefit to the economy is of having long-term equity financing in place for those growth companies and the benefit to the economy in terms of quality and jobs and job creation and supply chain if we have that in place? And secondly... Is there any country uh, in Europe or wherever that has actually got this right so that we're not forced to sell out uh, companies when they reach a certain scale? In, in relation to the first point, we, we actually got uh, the Hunter Centre for Entrepreneurship to look at the economic impact of what we do. So um, what, what they found was that for every pound that we invest into these companies, we're generating up to £14 of turnover, and turnover is important because that ad adds into GVA within the economy. And for every pound that we invest, we're creating up to £9 of GVA within the economy, so that's really important. And if you look at our uh, portfolio, up to half of the com these are very high-risk companies, and up to half of the portfolio will ultimately fail. But even those companies which have failed, we're still adding economic impact there through our investment because they're paying suppliers, they're employing people. But in terms of sustainable uh, growth, you know, it's important that we get some of these companies through to becoming sustainable standalone companies. And um, apologies if I gave the impression all of our companies uh, are, are bought. That's not the case. I mean, what we're trying to do is to take companies to the point where their options are, are open. So, so in a large number of cases, that will be uh, a trade purchaser. But equally, it could be private equity or it could be access to corporate uh, VCs or, or, or IPOs or, or whatever. What I would also say is that um, if you look at the two examples I provided earlier, Optos and uh, Touch Bionics, um, bear in mind we invested at the point where these were nothing more than really a, an idea on a piece of paper. When we exited Optos, it was employing 400 people. Um, now, it was, it, it's now owned by Nikon Corporation, but uh, it still employs 200 people in Dunfermline. So there's a real economic impact there. And Touch Bionics equally, you know, was a concept when we invested. At the point where we exited, it was employing 125 people. So, I mean, there's a clear economic impact there, if, if you can get that right. Maybe I'll just a couple of things. Um, I think it's important to recognise that the acquisition of a company can be a good thing for its growth. So, you know, as David alluded to there, I think the important aspect is having choices for companies and they can choose which route that they want to go down for the growth that they're looking for. So Skyscanner, which I know some of the um, committee have been out to see, they had every option really in front of them a very successful company and they chose to do the deal that they did because that was right for for their growth so i don't think we should look at acquisitions as as necessarily a bad thing although obviously sometimes it can be um but the other thing to mention that within scotch enterprise we did some research recently which is follow-up research to i think it was 2015 on acquisitions and the impact that they can have <clears throat> 
excuse me, and one of the things that, that, that we um, looked at was how Scotland compares to other comparator nations and within the wider UK on acquisitions. And we compare um, very similar to um, other uh, comparators to inward acquisitions, so the amount of companies buying one of our companies, but we actually compared much more favourably to those that still exist within Scotland, still has a big, have a big presence in Scotland. So I think that's a very positive thing for us. So we've allowed and our mechanism allowed us to anchor the companies here. So when they're, they're bought by a, by another company, they still see the benefit of the company being, being based in Scotland. However, where we did fare worse was outward acquisitions. So Scottish companies buying companies from elsewhere. And that's one of the things that we want to look at to try and work out why that is. And is that another option for growth for companies to get more support for, for these outward acquisitions? Thank you. Are there any further questions from committee members? Um, one, I think, from Andy Whiteman and then John Mason. No, fair enough. Andy Whiteman. Yes, I, I was just wondering, what's going to happen to the Scottish Investment Bank once the Scottish National Investment Bank is set up? And can you say something about the evolving governance relations about the SNIB in relationship not just to the Scottish Investment Bank, as it's currently established within Scottish Enterprise, but in relationship to uh, the point that Dean Lockhart made on the, on the growth fund? So the implementation plan has obviously been published and the recommendations in there are quite clear that there's a need to build on what exists in the um, market just now and where success is and also to do much more um, and part of that the, the recommendation is to bring in other things to the public sector within the National Investment Bank so the Scottish Investment Bank is one the, the Scottish Growth Scheme and the Holding Fund um, as mentioned earlier are others so that that's Benny's recommendation to ministers, ministers need time to digest that and discuss um, at Cabinet etc and um, with Scottish Enterprise and others and to work out you know, the, the way to take it forward. Now, part of those discussions will very much look at uh, you know, how that could happen and uh, the, the governance and everything else round about that. So still some way to go, um, I would suggest, until it's, it's, it's very clear what that will look like in due course. But as you can see from the recommendations, there's a real um, desire to do much more than exists just now, but very much to build on what exists and success is there. And, um, I mean, following up those recommendations, obviously it's for ministers to decide how to proceed, but do you feel there should be some... Uh, further kind of public consultation around this to allow for a more a broader discussion about how this should be structured? So there's been significant consultation already um, and that's certainly um, available publicly. I think all the, the different um, consultation documents and the discussions that, that Benny and the advisory board had. So um, I guess that's for government to, to decide if, if they feel they need any more. But certainly from, from what I've been involved in, there has been significant input into to that process. Um, would any of the other panel members like to make a final comment before we close the session? Well, very well. Thank you very much all for coming in. I'll suspend the session. We'll move into private meeting. Thank you.